Arthur Kwan Lee, thanks so much for joining me on the first Renaissance of Men video podcast. Boom. Good to be here. Will Spencer, Boom. Renaissance of Men, all day. You know, I'm really excited to talk to you for lots of reasons. Um, one is because you're awesome, and I've got so many questions to ask you about your history and about art, and also because I know some of the things we're going to talk about today with regard to your existing art, and I just know that we have a, dozens of topics that we can get into, so I've been really looking forward to this. Thank you, man. And, um, you know, to, to the audience of Will here, you know, we, we, we've been on this journey together, not that long, but we've already done a lot yeah. together from 21 convention to, to me seeing you really proliferate in that atmosphere. And now here we are, you know, the, the, uh, the resident artist of the manosphere. That's right. You know, that's, it's, it's actually funny that you mentioned that because I was just thinking that, you know, Anthony Johnson, president dream sent me, uh, he sent me some information about you. It would have been like May or June, something like that. And, uh, you know, he sent me your YouTube channel just to get a good over, overview of who you are and what you're into. And it's, I saw it and I was like, instant yes, got to talk to this guy. And right then on. in a really short time, you know, just in the past, in the past few months, you've, you become the resident artist of the Manosphere and your talk at 21 convention was a huge hit. Everyone said it was their favorite of the conference. And uh, so now oh, wow. I'm seeing you taking pictures with all kinds of heavy hitters and, and really emerging into the space and stepping into it. What's that journey been like for you over the past few months, not from relative obscurity, but really it's really like a transition. You know, you, you were in yeah. one space to, and now you're in a new one. It's, it, it was, you know, it, I guess you would call me a tranny. <laughs> I, I was, I was definitely in transition in that regard because, you know, I come from this, this, <laughs> this, this, this radical leftist art industry sure. and give a little bit of background. When I was in the New York scene, I was awarded Artist of the Year in 2020. And in 2016, the DMV, uh, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, they gave me Korean Artist of the Year as well. I don't do the mm. whole Korean thing, but nonetheless, let's just show you that I had a lot of... <laughs> yeah, you, don't look, you don't look like you do any of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's one of those things. But um, I, I had a lot of momentum behind sure. my practice in the gallery world. And I generated a, a following. And But what happened was I was making all these radicals agitated and obviously this you know this hatred of preserving cons conservatism is really this it's a deeper thing it's a hatred of masculinity itself mm -hmm. and the hatred of masculinity is a hatred of objectivity and order itself so mm -hmm. my work is all about putting archetypal symbolic imagery because these are what we denote too in regards to understanding universalities in different culture that allow us to see that no this is human nature men mm -hmm. have to stand up and create these patterns and pass them down. And that's what my imagery was doing aesthetically. So I was already making feminists annoyed, just the fact that that was a subject matter whilst getting all this following. And it was almost a graduation. You know, I spoke to Anthony about this. It was almost like I was meant to graduate to the Manosphere because I'm in this space where I'm already making the same people that hate the Manosphere agitated. So I might as well just join the tribe. It kind of mm -hmm. was that sort of equation, if that makes sense. So did you started out painting these sort of masculine images before you started having notions of of the reduced amount of masculinity in the culture like it was a subject matter that you were gravitating towards and then you realized like hey this is not around me just in my everyday life was that kind of how things unfolded yeah i i think i'm looking back in retrospect so the way you articulate that i at, at the moment when i was in the deep of it i wouldn't have been able to say that will but mm -hmm. but i know that being in the art world, it's almost like what we all feel culturally is even more saturated. This, yeah. this unprecedented censorship, this, this desire to uh, make people go into these identitarian political tribes. We all feel this to a degree. We all feel the wokeism. But if you work in the arts and entertainment, the dial goes up quite a bit and it almost seems hyperbolic. And mm -hmm. I, th I think. There's many things where, you know, we've heard people use the term clown world. Well, in the art industry, you are in this language of clown world. And, you know, it's, it's pre pretty much just a given. We have to take white men down and we have to be anti-American. And that's how you move up the ideological ladder of the art industry. And my brush was speaking for itself. They were, they were venerating me in that regard. They, they, they looked at me as like the golden beta boy. Oh, you're doing so good. You know, <laughs> just please mommy gallery. Oh, interesting. And I, I got, yeah, and I got to this point where I just realized that the gallery is just an extended ideological arm of the state today. 
And the state is just a way to replace the father. So I'm realizing that all of this toxicity is ventriculating and we need to sort of, as men come together and speak up and platforms like the Renaissance of Man or, or my Genesis Council or your, your the council, you know, all, all these tribes have to come together and, and fight this uh, Leviathan. I think that's really interesting because we're used to thinking of the state in terms of, of course, government, first of all. But then there's also this notion that the state is beginning to include corporations, that corporations and government are working kind of hand in hand with each other. But I, I don't know that people would think about the sort of the art wor arts world as a part of the state as well. But it sounds like what you're saying is, is that it is. Yeah, I, I mean, we, the, the state is fueled by collectivism, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so collectivism has different faces from uh, Black Lives Matter to uh, the, the misandrous feminist groups, those circles. Like these are all just different branches of collectivism, right? And, you know, I would say there's three sacred cows in the art gallery world. And it's going to sound familiar because it's in the outside of the field too. But my point is that the curators, the critics, dealers will castigate your source of income. That's a different story altogether than just mm -hmm. understanding it cerebrally if you're an artist. And those three sacred cows, the number one, something you shouldn't, yeah, no one's allowed to talk about. Um, I literally got a message from Instagram two hours ago before this show saying that they might delete my account, which is because what? you cannot attack the rainbow people. You can't talk LGBTQ. No. That's number one. Number two yeah. is you can't talk bad about uh, BLM or, or any of the, uh, uh, you know, the reverse racists that are out today, the Democrats. <laughs> and then finally, you can't talk about um, how we live in a matriarch. And, and those are three realities that, that anybody with common sense sees in front of them. But, you know, we can't, we just can't speak up about that because mm -hmm. it's, it's, toxic scene today, man. Yeah, we're really constrained in our ability to speak about the realities as, as we see them. And uh, yeah, all we have to do is look at the Rittenhouse case. You know what I mean? Like, like what's going on right now? This is an innocent white American right. who is defending himself from three thugs, from three loser degenerate thugs, one being a pedophile. And he did what everyone should rightfully do, which is protect himself. And, and, and if you know, if this is a case study of all of us protecting ourselves with firearms, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, but I think it's a great example of how, you know, strangely enough, this weird bald headed Asian guy in New York City is trying to stand up for white men. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> you know, who would have yeah, thought? What are the odds, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But you're really, I mean, are, are you, you're not really standing up for white men per se. You're standing up for men and you're standing up. I, I see you as standing up for yourself and you're standing up for the men right. that are aligned with you. And it's not like specifically you're going charging into the battlefield being like, hey, back off the white men. Like you're not doing that. It's like you're, you're, you're standing for masculinity more. And it's like, it doesn't really matter what color someone is who shares those values. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's the same with me. You know, it would be really easy, like, oh, you know, the manosphere or whatever is just a white men's movement. It's like, well, no, that's that's completely false. There are men around the world that participate in this. There are men of all cultures, men of our, all backgrounds, all races, um, that are that are part of that. And I think it gets unfairly portrayed in many ways as being sort of monoracial when it's it's really not. Yeah, it's it's definitely not monoracial. You know, we actually have real diversity because we want different vantage points to have conversations. I remember when Michael Foster and Tanner was on the same stage with Jack Donovan and Jeff Younger, and they have this epic religious conversation on the Redmond group during the 21 summit, right? Yeah. So, so there really is true diversity of ideas going on here. But I, I, I guess my thing is, and Jesse understands too. I just saw a Jesse Lee Peterson show, by the way. You crushed it. Oh, you know, thank you. Uh, that was fun. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jesse and I, we often talk about how like, but it's just really strange. Like we, we're here, uh, it's like we're, we're, we're allowed to talk about, you know, the struggles in the black community and, and how we can support it so much. And, 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 and you know, they even get to this tribal extent. But then we talk about white history and it's like, I mean, that it created the Western world. And for some reason, it's like, you know, as an Asian man, I can honor that the same way my degeneration above me took arms and went on the roofs. And mm -hmm. it, it makes the same sentiment and we can honor the values instilled in them. But I guess my thing is that like, I don't know, maybe work in the gallery scene. I've just seen like, uh, 
I've literally seen shows in the Lower East Side that was just literally that I don't know how to get away with this, but it was just the show is called Fuck White People. Like I've mm-hmm. seen things like that. So it's just, it's just, there's something about that where they want to find the enemy, right? And uh, I don't know, for me, I think that what we have to do is we need to, w- without hate, we got to get them all riled up because it shows the true colors. So people on the fence can all join our side, brother. Mm-hmm. And if that's going to be by uh, um, Jesse Lee Peterson's again, White History Month, or, or, <laughs> or, this uh, is great. Um, I mean, whatever form it's going to take, but, but, but there's something there. And, and, and I guess what I'm saying is that the reason why I mentioned the Rittenhouse case is because th- there, there's a lot of information in that uh, mm-hmm. about, about the reverse identity politics going on there. And it's an opportunity for us to expose the hypocrisy, you know, because th- this is a very, very, if you look at it apolitically, it's a textbook self-defense case, mm-hmm. right? You know, I, I spoke to my lawyer about this. I just asked him. And he's like, yeah, honestly, like, you know, I have, I have to be in the middle all the time because I have clients on both ends, but this is a textbook self-defense case. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and he's a, by the way, he's a high performing lawyer. And I said, oh, well, let me look at it myself. And it, it does play out. It's clear, you know, um, mm-hmm. it, it, it just says a lot about the landscape, brother. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very compromised landscape. It's kind of like enemy, enemy territory. You know, and, and how did it get to be this way? How did it get to be so unfriendly so quickly? And that's kind of the feeling behind the whole thing is that somehow almost, almost overnight, I mean, you would have a better sense of the evolution of the gallery scene in particular, because, you know, during your time in it, maybe it was always crazy. Maybe you saw it get crazier because the arts world just doesn't really have the same constraints that say the corporate world does because it's not as driven, driven by profits and numbers, you know, change doesn't change has to be incremental in the corporate world, but it feels like the gallery scene yeah. is so much more open and crazy and, and can just go nuts at any moment. Like, have you seen any sudden shifts or um, has it been more gradual? Like, what did that look like inside your world? Well, well, well first there is the historical shift, brother, which is a okay. fact that, you know, if you looked in the 1800s, arts education was like any other trade school. You know, if you want to learn plumbing, if you want to learn bricklaying, what do you do? You, someone teaches you the way you either go under their, their wing or you start your own business. And that's how art training used to be, atelier mm-hmm. based. You go in, you learn the trade. It's not this in, insurmountable university debt, but uh, art schools was actually created by the Frankfurt School. And they specifically wanted to make it about making art not about religion and making art about identity politics. And they make that very clear. There's, a, there's an article called Art and the Social World. Hold on. Did you just say that art school was invented by the Frankfurt School? It used to be like a trade school. What is atelier? So tell people what atelier means. Because you said it's like, it, uh, I know it's uh, a yeah. French word. So break that atelier, down because it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Atelier training is, um, um, it's like, it's, it's more skill-based training. Rather, it's, not a, a, it's not like you don't get no degree or anything like that. Like, like most, of, most of our art, art education was atelier-based, which is a master and his apprentice, basically, right? Okay. You study under somebody who has, who has a uh, much older, who is passing down, ideally a man, by the way, if you're sure. a boy, right? Um, I had a four foot something strict Korean woman, but she got the job done, whatever. Yeah. You know, okay. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she, she was, she was old school, conservative, badass though. So it's all good. Right. Um, but um, yeah, the idea was a master and apprentice. That's like the art, art atelier model. You, you know, mm-hmm. and usually they would have a couple of apprentices. They help them out, but he teaches them techniques in turn. You know, it's like an intern kind of thing a little bit. That, mm-hmm. that was the model originally, but then John Murphy, he wrote Art and the Social World. And he wrote specifically that, well, you look at the role of artists in our history, we are spiritual servants. That is a role historically. Our job is the point of art. Status quo. Let's let's make this foundational. What the what is the point of art? The function. The point of art is to fortify and make beauty out of the values that you're protecting and fighting and believe for. That's what it is. You put a painting up on your wall, it permeates that through your entire home, mm-hmm. right? It's a transcendental mirror. That's the that's the role of art. Um, and he he understood that and he realized, well, you know. We couldn't win. Our Marxism failed, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to get into, we're going to get into the culture. So economic economic Marxism failed. Economic Marxism failed. 
Yeah. So cultural Marxism is a, uh, this is very feminist, very passive aggressive, right? Rather than outward yeah. aggression. This yeah. is a very feminine force going on. And he, he lays it down saying that we need to um, make the art industry, and this also implies hologram entertainment, into our political arm so that, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, what your bright part, politics is down from culture. Right. You know, he, he caught that. And I'll tell you right now, if, if you see an artist at a gallery and their paintings have all this uh, vague, relative, gestural mark making that's all over the map, um, that, that doesn't imply anything symbolic or deeper, I guarantee you that it was produced by somebody more on the far left, usually. Mm -hmm. It's, sure, it's, a yeah. pretty, it's a pretty damn good generalization. I wouldn't say universally, but generally. That's a good way to go about it. And that, that's not for nothing. Because they believe that men can be women. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So they, yeah, they believe anything sure. can be art. If, they can, if, a, if, a, if, a, if, a, if there's somebody on the left, you know, they can believe that gender is a social construct. Of course, they believe that uh, a banana duct taped to a wall can, can be fine art. You right. know? It, it's, it's all... Um, Flipping things around, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It reminds you remind me of my time. Well, not you, but what you're saying reminds me of my time in the New Age world in San Francisco, where n nothing is forbidden and everything is permitted. Where, you know, you can be whatever and you can do whatever, and your your, your creativity is equivalent to art. And creativity and art are not the same thing. A lot of creativity goes into art, but it takes more than just creativity to turn something to turn something into art. Creativity like you know, it's one of those things like it's just the number one and you put one plus one, you get a lot of creativity, you get two, but art is one plus one equals three. But, you know, the new age world, for example, would prioritize creativity and simple being rather than the cultivation of self into something that is bounded and beautiful. It says, no, you're just fine the way that you are. Wow. And so this leftist ideology kind of permeates so many different aspects of culture now that we all kind of have to wake ourselves up from. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. You know, um, Huh. That that articulates a lot of what I feel. Um, mm -hmm. th there's a uh, this idea of uh, you know producing art just to be expressive, and I'm an artist. You know, it's very yeah. uh, uh, and, and I find it analogous to. I th I think the suffering of our artistic standards is synonymous with our dissolution of understanding what it is to be religious and hmm. yes b because and i can channel this in my own life i'll share this if you look at my own paintings if you guys just google my name google arthur Conley, go to images you'll see all these different you'll see high skill set technically speaking because i'm using sure. the training that my masters gave me but the subject matter not the formalism the contextualism the context is, and, and the language that i'm exploring what am i doing well, I'm trying to depict the religious. So you see, you see that I'm kind of getting to the point, but I am depicting a lot of pantheism. You know, this idea that mm -hmm. every religion is saying the same thing. But if I can be um, maybe controversial to certain circles, <laughs> I, I don't believe Bring that. It. Yes, I, I, I believe that the boundary dissolving form of the spiritual experience because spiritual can even mean dark spiritual, right? The, 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 sure. You know, words are packages, right? So we need to yeah. be specific with our language. The boundary dissolving form of spirituality that we're all endless love and star stuff. I think that's a very adolescent form of the religious thinking. And Amen. yeah. And, and, and this, this is why, you know, I had a lot, a big discussion about this in my art collective. And this is the problem we have with, the causal community and Alex Gray. Oh, powerful yeah. skill set, amazing yes. skill set. Incredible. But it's so dependent on, on the substance in a way, right? And, yes. and it's almost like, you're not, I understand they're trying to be bodhisattvas going to the other side and bringing it down to, to, the, to normal life, but they're not really nested on base reality and they don't actually understand the historical context and pedagogical themes that undergirds what they're kind of taking for granted to believe that they can just look in the sky. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're kind of just ignoring this vast art historical context and just historical context itself that allows mm -hmm. you to kind of see that you no, know, a real religious thinking is it. You're not limitless. 
you know, you're not God. <laughs> you know, that's what I look at the Christian iconographic. Yes, yes you are. You're as, God. As yes, art. you're all God. <laughs> Maybe. So, you know, no, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, mean I, I mean, that that's that's Mind that's you. very dangerous waters. Yeah, super dangerous. I, 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 I look at the, the the Christian iconography as actually. Um, so, like, I'll agree with Campbell and a lot of these characters that, you know, the point of the artist is to constantly recreate these stories so that we don't forget them. I, I understand that. I understand yes. that's kind of, there's, there's a, a employment there if you're going to be an artist. That's kind of your job, right? Sure. So you're yes. a servant. Do not forget. You're not an artist of your ego. You're an artist for the soul. You're a servant. Yep. Yep. And it's important to, to starve the ego and be the soul if you're, if you're an artist. And I, and I get that, but my problem is that often they, they end up thinking that means we just need to disintegrate all our moral standards and, and it's all uh, relativism is a problem. Mm -hmm. that, that's what ends up always becoming. And, and, and that's something I got a problem with. So I will tell you, this is the, actually, this is the first time I'm sharing this, Well, on your show. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be taking a year sabbatical with Trinity Church. We're going to be diving deeper into Christian iconography, history, symbolism with academics, apologetics, and some ministers. Oh, I'm not going to be painting for a year so I can get deep into the content and I can step my game up. But I will wow. still be on the council. I'll still be on social media unless I get banned, <laughs> which is possible. But, but, <laughs> but, but I'm, t I'm taking a dive into uh, biblical material. Um, and I'm not like a Bible-thumping guy, but I, it's very fun to me. It's yeah. very exciting. You know, like, like all you got to do is hear Michael Foster talk and you go, geez, like I never heard the Bible like this. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, I want to do that. I want to do that visually. It's so needed. It's so needed because I, I, I remember at your 21 talk, which I want to get into, you showed many of uh, the contemporary artists who you like and respect who are taking a more formal approach, a more traditional approach to, uh, you know, to their art. And I wonder if and, and and you use a lot of different uh, images, a lot of symbolic, mythological, archetypal kind of images, and I kind of found myself wondering, like, wow, is there anyone that's reinterpreting a lot of this epic Christian iconography and Christian art in a more modern yeah. way? Because you can look at you know Michelangelo, or you can look at Leonardo da Vinci, or you can look at Raphael, or all the Renaissance painters, or all the you know, all the painters whose whose images we've all seen. But it's like who's telling these classic stories in a modern way? Right? Who's telling it to, to 21st century eyes? You know, granted, we can look at the universal themes of you know, the great art from history and we can see ourselves reflected in it, but the aesthetics and the approach and the medium and the techniques have changed so much, even if on the other side of like Van Gogh, right? So it's like, how would an artist today, with the benefit of 500 years of history between now and the Renaissance, and all these different techniques and, and, and advances and, and various painting technologies, et cetera. Oh, man. How would they reinterpret these, these stories? And it sounds like that's what you're going to be doing. I, I hope so, brother. I, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm excited for this opportunity. I'm going to be uh, going down to Florida in a few months just so that I can... Uh, I'm not becoming a monk. I'm not going to be like inaccessible, but... The studio says practice the, says the, the Asian guy with the shaved head. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, this is the ball community a... conversation, you know. <laughs> this is right, but but no. but, but it's it's <laughs> but 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 I'm but I'm excited, man. It's it's going to be different, sure. and 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 you're right. Uh, the new painting materiality today is is so crazy, and you know what we have to do is inspire these next line of artists to not go to the radical leftists, which they're lining up for right now, by the way, as we speak, all the generations of artists, all this creative talent, all these creative people who understand in their, in, in, in their belly, masculinity has got to come up and become benevolent and we've got to help each other, right? Like, like they yes. understand, they understand that heart and they understand that, that there's a real love there. What do they do? They're going to go to the gatekeepers because I mean, it makes sense for the, in their logic to go to these gatekeepers, but they don't realize these gatekeepers are going to force them into social camouflage and that's going to contaminate their soul and there's art making. And then they're going to end up lowering their standards and they're, they're going to produce uh, work that makes them hate why they got into the, what they love in the first place. Is that, are they really going to, okay, are they really, these new artists, are they really going to go into the art world and think that they can maintain their integrity? Like, like, because they might, but it, seem, it, seems, it would seem profoundly naive to me to think that someone can, can engage with any, any part of the arts world 
and think that, oh yeah, I'm going to talk about masculinity and that's going to be fine. Like that seems really nice. Well, 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 you're right. We're right about that. Most yeah. artists today though, they don't know. They, okay. they just don't know. Like, like when I had my show at the Corcoran gallery for my thesis, like, and the attention I got for that, like that was already awesome. And I was like, this is, this is amazing. And this is it. Like, great. I'm on the road. Immediately. I, I was, uh, and then we're talking as a young man, you know, I'm talking about as a young man, like 19 years old, mm-hmm. I found myself at these really deranged parties mm-hmm. and yeah, just immediately. And, you know, luckily for me, I, I had enough of a relationship with my father so that I, I can recognize that this is all a shadow manifestation of power. Mm-hmm. All these adults creeping on and, and a lot of older gay men talking to young male artists. And mm-hmm. you just got to tell them to, to, to buzz off. But yeah, a, a lot of it, as you go up, it becomes, um, I'm not going to get into the darker side of it. We'll, sure. we'll see. There'll be a time for that. But it's yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's an underbelly of the art world work yeah. where if you want to, they will only give you success. I'm talking about the high one. Yeah, sure. There's, dif- there's different levels. I had a little taste of that, but I was kicked out. But, but, but there's a level up there Praise where, God. Um, <laughs> Praise God. Got kicked out. Really? Praise, Praise God. God. Yeah. But 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 th- but there's a level of that art world where if if you hang out enough and they vet you well, yeah. All the sushi dates and all those you know those parties where you drop your phone in the Ziploc bag in front and you get a number and you go and who knows what's there. If you if you hang out with those parties I, enough, well, I don't know anything about those parties. <laughs> Say more. <laughs> I, I I hope I, I hope I'm you sorry. don't. Um, they're yeah, they're gonna see if they can compromise you or if you yeah. can join their little occulted club. And then yeah. if you join the club, I mean, look, it's no coincidence that the most the most successful artists are Marina Abramovich, Jeff Koons, and John of God. They're all satanic artists that are John, want the culture to be degenerate. John and, of God. Um, John of God was an artist. Well, well, he calls himself a uh, like a surgeon artist or something, where he like literally like like mm. mutates people's bodies and they consent to it. Yes, it, it's okay. it's it's really dark stuff. But yeah. I, I'm I'm just saying that like. Um, I've been to a couple parties that made me realize that this, I mean, this is not, this is not going to ever line up with who I am, but Amazing. if, Good. if they're, if they're expecting you to schmooze with them, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's just a whole nother thing. And I'll be honest, man, I was being a beta male. I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm here, but I wasn't participating in their, in their, in a lot of their buffoonery, but I was there, you know? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> excuse me. Bless you. COVID, you know, Chinese. But. <laughs> you should wear a mask when you're on a Zoom call. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's, it's I, I, would, I would sort of reframe it a little bit and say, you know, I think it's a good thing. Um, I think it's a good thing that you were there, even though that you were being a good little beta male. At least you showed up and you saw it. You know, it's like, no. it's important that you saw it because you got to see, you, it, it you decided real quick then and there, no, this is not who I am and this is not who I want to be. But you still got to see things that most people only, they only, they only hear about in rumor. And I think that's really important. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. formative. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm going to one day, uh, and, I, and I have a connection for this, but this is much later. I'm, I'm going to just say some names later. You know, I know people who have followings or, or influence and I've seen them do things, but I'm not going to do it anytime soon. I'm not in a position yeah. to do that. I, I'm not big enough to do anything like that. I can, I have to stay vague like this. Right. Of course. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's strategically smart to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know, I know people that I have had it way harder than me and they, they tell me the same thing. Just keep, you can keep speaking up for what you believe is right in your heart, but don't get, you know, in regards to, certain heads i'm not going to be so specific yet you know no but i will be later well you don't need to start beef right now you have other things yeah. to do you know, it's like, you know <laughs> no, yeah i mean i'm trying there's... to make like i'm really i'm trying to make good art man I, I mean this this is the thing like i would have never thought that these radicals cared so much what this introvert painter does in his studio like i'm not out in marches and trying to get people to wear maga hats or anything crazy like that I, you know right. but so so when i was getting attacked by some of these characters you know i was telling you before we started that you know 
the most striking incident for me of uh, recent was end of last year. I, I got these fireworks shot out of my window from Antifa. And I couldn't help but think, I'm like, I remember the first thing I thought was like, this is what the hell is going on. Right. But the next thing I thought was like, why do they care what I think? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, I was, I almost tell people that I was pushed to the side where like, I'm like biting back now. You know what I mean? Cause it's, um, th- but, but the point is they don't, they just hate God. This is all this deep underlying hatred for their fathers and God because, because yep. the father represents that order. And all my artwork is about resurfacing that the masculine that has been uh, pushed down because our culture is a matriarchy today. Mm-hmm. So that's what my art is about. So I, to me now, it's not, now I get it. You know, it's not mm-hmm. a coincidence now, you know, uh, th- this is, this is what they hate right here. Mm-hmm. You know, very much, very much with their entire beings, many of them, many of them, and many of them are so lost. And it's really sad because I've seen this, you know, in, mot- in lots of different communities during my time in San Francisco, lots of people are so lost and they're suffering and they, you know, get themselves involved in, you know, so many bad practices and so many bad industries. I'm not even, not even talking about the high level stuff that you're talking about, but, you know, just from being inside the dance music scene in San Francisco, seeing you know, the lost and broken people, the drug use, the drug abuse, the alcoholism, yeah. you know, the constantly chasing the next party, the next high for the fulfillment in their personal lives are a mess. They're bitter, they're angry, they're not people you would want to spend time with in person. And, uh, you know, because I tried. And it was always so confusing to me. And only recently have I really come to understand what was going on, that, you know, it's, it's this desire to try and find this feminine, you're okay as you are kind of acceptance. And if we all hang together, we're all okay. And no one yeah, wants to be the well guy. Said. Yeah. No one wants to be the guy to say, you know what? You're not okay as you are. And you know, and the beauty of Christianity is that none of us are, none of us are in any privileged position to say, yeah, I'm okay as I am. Even I can't say that none of us as humanity are, we're all in this together, but we all have to be moving forward. But that idea is antithetical to a lot of people who don't ever want to be told no. Yeah. I mean, they're not, they wouldn't, they would never, they wouldn't even understand the sentiment no. of carrying your cross. Right. I mean, I mean mo- most of these folks, are, they have, they carry so much resentment. It's a deep seated, like it's a deep pit. They have yeah. so much resentment, even the successful ones who have so much money, the anger that they have to even project this sort of reality onto the external world, it speaks for itself. And it's hard to, you know, you see them in their flash. And all the beautiful women, this, that, and the other, but they have no context to appreciate it properly, and they have no order behind it. So it's 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 all deafening, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, this is it's really hard for people to hear this. Like we all get exposed to, you know, how the the Hollywood weirdos, you know what I mean, what's going on there. But to imagine that it happens, you know, to the degree that it does in so many different creative communities, is really d- disheartening. But I think it's a necessary disillusionment. You have to see it. You have to see it and something within your heart needs to say, not that I am not going to be a part of that. And that's fundamentally a masculine thing, right? Yeah. Setting boundaries. Yeah. For you yourself, know? if nothing yeah. else. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, and people can say it's a masculine thing. I think it's biologically a man, a male thing to look, we, we look, you know, yeah. um, we as men biologically, we have to set boundaries and set objective standards. Yes. yes, there can be woman bosses and female managers, but everyone fucking hates her, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a coincidence, man. And, and, and it's humorous because that stere- it's a stereotype, but it is true. And it's really interesting. And, and even if there's a cool boss, like, I think it boils down to the fact that it's like, can't help but nature will tell you like, shouldn't you be at home with some kids? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, you, you can't help, but like, um, you can't escape nature, man. And, and, and it's, and it's designed perfectly if we embrace it and, and, and use and understand that we can walk side by side with its, its functional purpose. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're changing all the terms, man. And yeah. this, this is why it's so important Anyone even listening to this conversation, like you got to do your part, man. We all have to speak the fuck up. And if, if you don't, if you don't stop, um, that silence is going to kill you and it's going to kill mm-hmm. your kids. Mm-hmm. You know? I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, you go ahead. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And you know, I think the, the way things aren't 
way they're not talked about, the way they should talk about, be talked about is like, look, you know, random high school girl getting ready to think about college or a career, you can pursue high level professional success, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you a part of yourself as it would cost a man a part of himself too. And I think the big lie of so many different political movements is this idea that you can get something for nothing. Like, yeah, you can be a high power professional and you can be a great mother and have kids and be a homemaker. And so women get overwhelmed. They're like, I'm trying to have it all. And I'm, it's overwhelming. Like, well, yeah, because you can't get something for nothing. If you want to be super successful in your career, you can do that, but you're going to have to get more testosterone in your body to compete. And that's going to take you away from your natural feminine core. That's just how it is. I don't make the rules. I just work here. And just tell women that. And give them, <laughs> really, that's what I tell people. It's like, look, yeah, tell, I, tell, yeah, tell me I'm wrong. That. Tell me you can have it all. Tell me that you have you have 48 hours in a day to be both, you know, hyper hyper feminine and free and hyper masculine and directed. You can't you can't do it. it. Doesn't work that way. But women don't get that message, and I think they need to. Hear, they deserve to hear it. They're, they're, women are smart enough to hear that message and decide for themselves. But I think the reason why they don't get that message is because I think a lot of people in these political moments movements know what women would say if they were told the truth. Yeah, you, you know, uh, uh, it's almost like, you know, you know we, we all have to check our girls, right? Like every, any man who's, who's living the right way, you have to train your girl. You have to guide her. And mm -hmm. people could say, oh, you have to train your girl. What is she, a dog? No, but you still have to train her. I don't care. Like I've been a martial artist my whole life. I've been trained. I've been trained by so many masters. I've had people train me. I've trained many young martial artists coming into the game. I've trained other painters. Everyone has to be trained depending on it. And this applies to relationships too. Relationships and that selectivity associated with it is also a sword to be sharpened. Your girl has to be trained, right? And when I trained my girl, I told her specifically, I said, listen, baby, medicine doesn't taste good, but it's good for you. There's a lot of things that girls have to hear that they don't, that it's a reality check, but it's going to make them way more based and grounded. Right. And yes. down the line, they're going to be a lot more happier. And men are better at long term strategy and looking down the line. Women are just short term. You know, it's funny because um, I think, wasn't it Aristotle? It was one of the ancients who said this that if you look at women, <laughs> this does everything. This is a wrap up everything right here. Mm. Women define evil. I'm sorry. Um, well, let me start it correctly. I'm paraphrasing. Mm. Sorry. That's fine. Uh, men, men define evil by divergence to a set of abstract principles prioritized. And okay. women define evil as that which is blocking their immediate desires. That says everything right there. Wow. Yeah. That okay. tells you everything philosophically speaking. Men have to be the philosophers because we're not on, we don't have as many puppet strings towards looking at things with a logical conclusion. And, I, and it's crazy because you can tell a girl that she can have it all and she'll be so quick to buy it. It's crazy. I, and I'm in here in New York City <laughs> and, and, and I see this repetitively and I go, your ovaries are dying. Like you're going you're gonna to regret this. You got to stop this. And, and it's so disappointing, especially when there's like, I, there's so many beautiful girls here who are just becoming more masculine. I've seen evolutions happen with girls where I met them years ago when I came to the city and I see them later again in the gallery, I'm like, oh, you've been busy. You know, I mean, I mean, the, all the nice fat that goes to the right areas is, is, is becoming more stiff. It's, it's mm. pretty interesting. You know, it's all physical, you know, because it's mental, right? Sure. Yeah, of course. Our bodies are a manifestation of our minds and our hearts, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you put that, you put that together beautifully, by the way, at your, um, your speech, man. We're going to have to do a poll who's, who's was the groundbreaking because I heard the same thing you said about mine when we started in the intro about yours. So it's pretty funny. That's we might cool. actually be rivals here. Uh -oh. <laughs> Bald rivals. <laughs> Bald rivals. Non-hair Americans. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, no, I, I, I know what you mean. And, you know, to your point about training women, I think, I think the problem is that they've already, they've already been trained. You know, if you want to mm -hmm. say, like, I think the culture puts far firmer hands on women and tells them what to be um, than I think men probably ever will, at least in this current generation. You know, I think, I think the culture tells them, no, you have to, you have to work, you have to career, have a career because otherwise 
you're betraying all the generations of women who came before you. Feminism saved women's lives and stuff like that. So it trains them really hard. And I don't know that what you're doing is, is so much training in the way that at least you're framing it. It's more like liberating from ideas they've already been trained by, right? It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not mm. training from zero. It's sort of like, no, these ideas, they're, they're probably not serving you in some ways that you're not even allowed to question. That's what I find anyway, that women are That's just every point. Yeah, so like, I, you're I'm going to change my model. I'm going to be. I'm going to be telling my girl that, hey, I'm not training you. I'm just unplugging you from all the bullshit. And, and don't get mad at me. Will said it. <laughs> That's why I send him my way. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> Book a deep listening session with no, me. No, no, no. But, but 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 absolutely, <laughs> yeah. man. It, it's uh, and and it's such it's such a shame, man. Where uh, you're right. Like men don't hear anything positive today, man. Young young men. No. It's it's crazy, and, and it's a big reason is because. Women are naturally collectivists. That's just what it boils so. down to. I, mean, I think so. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, the, the feminization of society is inevitably connected to the expansion of the state. And J.D. Unwin, he t- writes about this in Sex and Culture. And the idea that the greatest, he actually mapped out, there's a book called Sex and Culture by J.D. Unwin. He maps out the, the, the super high-performance alpha males who created civilizations really behind and, and all yeah. the everyone back behind them right they consciously chose not to uh they consciously exercise semen ret- retention and chastity mm-hmm. and they and they did that in conjunction to mapping out as women become more sexually liberated um societal decadence formulates and everything falls from there it's it's kind of like this and, and it sounds so crazy like like you're trying to control one's body and the other. I'm like, well, yeah, because there's a pattern here. And at least we should at least be able to have a conversation about it. And, you know, just, just it, it plays on a couple levels. Like one, everyone just look at your mom and your dad. Okay. I'll, I'll, here's a great example. I shared a story with a couple of friends before just to try to illustrate this point. Uh, when I was a kid, my brother and I, we got into a big, like traumatic fight. We, we, we really got into, you know, a lot of anger and hatred for each other at that time. We got each other's bloody nose and really got banged up. Well, like you're trained in, kind of situation. You're huh? trained in, ta- you're trained in Taekwondo too. So it's like, this is, this is pretty serious business. Yeah. Well, I mean, I got thrown in the nation a couple, a couple years in a row, but, my, but I lost my brother often. <laughs> so just to give you context, he was also <laughs> Delhi. He's also a Delhi guy. I feel like and there's a movie he's about taller this. And, and he's, yeah. Uh, well, well, with that, man, I mean, like, we once had a real crazy fight where we're being insecure, but well-equipped, well-equipped, like, egocentric losers who are mad at each other. So we oh, use that skill set. We're beating the shit out of each other. My mother comes home. She sees that we're, we're not talking and the, the house is divided. She feels the energy. And she brings us both over. She goes, what happened? And we start pointing at each other a little bit, this and the other. We didn't give a shit in our heart. If we're honest, you know, it's our mother. We're not going to disrespect her, but we knew we don't really care what this woman's going to say because we know what she's going to say. You're both my kids. I love you equally. You shouldn't be fighting. You're both wrong. Amen. Um, That's what uh, autopilot saying. mother, right? That's right. That's right. Distribution of resources right there. It's beautiful. And then we walk away. What we're both thinking at separate corners of the house is fuck when dad gets home. Yeah, you're fucked. Yeah, especially yeah. the military veteran dad. We used to be a bodyguard for security because he's such a good fighter. And he, he, he comes into the house. He says, come on in. Come over here. Uh-oh. We both sit down. He says, who started it? This is the Mrs. Masculinity order. Who started it? Yeah. Not I love you both. Whose fault is it? Who started it? I recognize there's a difference between fighting fire with fire and who started the initial fire. Who started the fire? Who started this? There's a morality thing going on here. My brother trickles his hand up me. He says, this is your fault. Done. Respect. Someone's right. Someone's wrong. There's order involved. So we understand mm-hmm. this at like a household level. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's what you said is just as deep. Just a second part to this, man. Like men are not getting encouragement. Like every man should know that like you, every man tuning in, like I don't care what your situation is. Like you got to be a king of your own house, man. Like you are a fucking superhero. Listen, like it's so important to have that. Like, like, like without being like, pushing other people down and thinking you're better than them. Like you need to have this perspective. Like I'm going to pick up my sword 
and I'm I'm the knight here. You know what I mean? I'm the warrior that's gonna slay that dragon. I'm I'm using a lot of Jordan Peterson analogy here, but sure. But but it's it's really important because uh, it's true. You know, it's true. Like every time you see somebody, like you, your evolution says it all. Like and it, and it, that's why so many people are moved by it because you like vulner. You you hit the nail on the head on it, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have to look at yourself as the, like this main character almost. Not to say that um I'm a solipsist, but you kind of have to look at it as like you are the character here and you can change the world. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. You can if you can change yourself and you can you can change the world. I believe that. And if you're willing to if you're willing to be I, I can't say that this is what I did for myself because I would need to think more about how much it applies, but it's not wrong. But you know what I told myself was that I have the ability to change my own my own mind. And by change my own mind, I don't mean like swap one idea for another. Totally transform the way that my mind works, to tune up the engine, to make everything work better, to get the places that I want to go, because I recognize I can't get there from here. The man that I am now currently with the way that I think about things, my habits, my beliefs is not sufficient to get me where I want to go in life. And Mm. I can see that. It's not producing happiness for me. It's producing suffering. My own mind, my own choices, my own beliefs, my physical presence in my own body is generating suffering. And that means that I can do something about it because it's happening in here and it's happening in my heart. And so I I just never took no for an answer, not even even from myself. And uh, and I think that's that's the stage that men have to get to. It's painful. It's it's definitely painful. There's definitely a lot of times where I had to spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, you know, fair, a fair bit of money as well, but mostly time and energy, you know, to really just turn myself inside out. And yeah. if men are willing to commit to that process, there's nothing they can't do. There's nothing. Yeah, they that's can't. it. Yeah, because and, I had boundaries with myself. And and uh, when men are masculine, they respect other men's boundaries, and yes, that's and a women, great and, and women's boundaries too. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, and it allows, and men who respect boundaries, you can work with them towards, yes. you know, greater pursuits, right? You, you can really be, you can, uh, I can speak as an artist. You can make novelty to go to another level, right? That this is, uh, and I've seen this with the Genesis Council, for example, just having different guys come together who have those values lined up, like we're in the works of some beautiful collaborative artistic endeavors. Mm-hmm. and. And, and this is what I'm talking about. I don't care what your sword is. It can be a brush. It could be a mic. It could be a film, you know, uh, whichever form you take it, you need to participate in the landscape. And I think every man has to do so. I really do believe so. Like we have to understand that, like, you know, the only one above you is the one above you. Beyond that, you know, walk with some light on your feet. And I, like, I know it sounds so, uh, Cliche, but I, I think that genuine benevolent masculinity is going to save the world, man. Mm-hmm. I really do. Because, like, what do I hear repeated like parrots all around me in New York City? Toxic masculinity, right? Mm-hmm. And toxic masculinity, I, you know, I've been thinking about this. And I just want to like sh- grab all these, these skinny beta males and, and just tell them, and, and you know, like, yeah. No, y- y- like, first of all, all the people saying toxic masculinity, they've probably never been under a squat rack ever. Like, right. I, I almost want to say like, no, because it's the, it's the absence of masculinity that is toxic. The men who mm-hmm. lack masculinity are the ones who cheat on their partners, Dang. are the ones who are physically abusive, who are the ones you cannot trust if you're in, a, if you're in the trenches in, in battle. You see what I'm saying? You want men mm-hmm. who have that masculinity because then they're conscientious and mm-hmm. they can step up together. And, and that's, that's something that I think the 21 is trying to articulate from so many different vantage points, um, or just the manosphere in general, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Masculinity was taken away from men probably sometime between like 19, 1910 and 1960 in stages. You know, first you have World War I, which blows away the, some of the best and brightest of the generation. Then you have the Great Depression, which starves a whole bunch more out and makes a whole bunch jump out of the window, unfortunately. And then you have World War II, a whole bunch more get blown away. And then they cut and that's the that's the physical war on men. And then you have and then you have Korea as well. And then 
And then as soon as after successive generations of men have been blown away physically, in 1960 is when the cultural war on men began. The physical war stopped and the cultural war began. So yeah. men have been under attack. There's been war on men for the past hundred years to, to basically blow the masculinity out of them. And so as a result of that, you have men who lack masculinity showing up in a bunch of different ways. You have the super macho guy that is not a masculine man in my estimation. And you have the weak, sort of effeminate beta male soy boys that is also not a masculine man. But the thing is, what both of those men need is they need real masculinity. And that transforms both of them. It, it, it rounds them out. It helps them speak to each other, understand their gifts. And so for that reason, I say our culture, by the way, everything that our culture says do the opposite, right? Culture says masculinity <laughs> is the problem. What does that mean? Masculinity is the solution. And that's the, that's the place that I've ultimately come to. Like, you got a problem as a man? Apply some masculinity to it, and you'll sort out the problem. I, like, I, I agree. It's you know, Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just do whatever the opposite of what the dominant narrative said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, it, it's funny because what, what you are saying in regards to do the opposite of what the cultural norm is, that used to be what the traditional artist was, the dissident. Oh wow! And okay. it, it's it's really interesting how it's flipped. Where now to be counterculture is to be a preserver of tradition, and it's flipped. Yeah, and, and it's strange because I often tell people when they're like, you know, I get all these messages and people are like, "Oh, you have you have these balls and all this going ads." I'm like, I really don't. I I believe I'm just being an artist, and if I'm just mm -hmm. going to be an artist. What is a dominant narrative? Women are the best and unstoppable. Men are all, you know, they're all rapists in hiding. Uh, <sighs> gay people are the most oppressed. Like it's it's just so typical. I can just, you know, riff about all these lists. But so, what is the artist supposed to be in that context? If we're supposed to push against the dominant narrative. There should be a maelstrom of different mediums going in this direction towards traditional values and fighting for socially cohesive ideas. But, and I think that actually would be the case if it wasn't for all the gatekeepers that are on the radical left. And I've shared this before because so many creative people in different mediums and actually some famous people have told me, I would never speak up the way you did because it would sure. destroy my career. But mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate that you did that. And I go, well, you're the problem. Yes. <laughs> that was the right response. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, w w but, you know, I mean, I mean, they're really nice people. So, so, I mean, like, I'll still grab a drink with them. Right. They're, they're still, yeah, like, sure. really sweet. But in my head, I'm thinking, I'm like, but it's like, you're letting them treat your beliefs like you're like a pedophile or something <laughs> you know what i mean it's like it's 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 so crazy and, you, and you're, you're that's what i'm saying i'm just like no i just i just don't trust the government <laughs> like like you see what i'm saying it's it's so crazy it's my so youtube crazy. channel's gonna last about 30 minutes <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do you know what are you gonna do no you're right yeah. you're right it's no, crazy I mean, well you have to you you have to be willing to take and this is what you did you, you have to be willing to acquire social capital not just, and, and I guess financial capital, you need money yeah. and you need your status and your credibility, and you have to be willing to set it all on fire in pursuit of the truth. And, and you can do that in a bunch of little drips slowly over time and slowly turn the ship of the Titanic, like many male leaders are doing today, or you can light the whole thing on fire in one big giant bonfire, you know, at the right time. Hashtag originism. Boom. Unpack that. I've seen that. I don't know what it is. I've seen the tag. I have a sense of what it is, but explain it to me. Yes. So in the Genesis Council, the artist collective that I started, this is look, like, there's all these different tribes, right? And I often look at it as Jesus Christ is, is, uh, is, uh, William Wallace. Okay. And he's getting all these different clans, all the Scots together. There's uh, order of men, Renaissance of men, Genesis Council. Now there's 21, like, all these different clans. Yeah. And, and, and we're all coming, but what are we doing? We're all fighting the radical left. We're all fighting the English. That's okay. kind of like the, the, the way I explain it. Like, no, it's true because yeah. we're yeah, all yeah, allies. No, you're right. Like, you're right. Yeah. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, like, like we, we, we all actually respect each other too. Like, mm -hmm. we genuinely do. So, so it's like we're all coming together. And we're all, we recognize the enemy there. 
And, and that's kind of the context of it. And the Genesis Council is where all the artists come. Mm -hmm. And we have all these different types of creative mediums in the council. And we're all supporting each other. And we're all diving into deep subject matter so that we can, you know, iron sharpens iron. That applies mm -hmm. aesthetically too. So mm -hmm. we're in here doing so. And we say, you know what? Traditionally, art movements are passed down. You know, from Art Nouveau to Fauvism, it's, it's always usually passed down. And we, we all can't help but come to this consensus that some well beyond the generation of postmodernism, it's, it's, it's the radical left is not going to pass the torch. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. You're yeah. going to let it go ad infinitum. So we realize that it must try. be declared. Yeah, we need to declare the next movement. Mm -hmm. And that next movement is, there's a declaration. A declaration to yielding our materiality to the logos. A declaration to reject relativism. And a declaration to the origin. Originism. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we are coming back to the center and using art for its central purpose in the first place. Oh, that's great. And, and, and what you actually said really encapsulates this. In the Genesis Council, we clearly believe that the foundation of an artist, even before their aesthetic training or their eye or their classical background, whatever you call it, the techniques associated with it, the basics, the fundamentals, is a pursuit of truth. Mm -hmm. Your art should all be nested upon you are a seeker of truth and a person who will speak the truth with their medium. That's the foundation. Now learn the techniques and now build a portfolio. Now excavate your interests. But you should have that vantage point. And the diversity is crazy with that because we all have different experiences. We all have different interests. We all have different body types. We all eat different food, whatever it is. Like that all affects and we all are attracted to different color combinations and different materiality. So, but originism is this idea that, um, we need to go back to base level of reality and understand that, that the point of artists is to pass down this, the archetypal realities in human nature so that we do not lose touch with it. And, mm -hmm. and, and, we're, and we're doing so. We have poets, we have filmmakers, we have actors. And it's pretty fascinating that I don't care what the artistic medium is. We all feel this. We all feel what's going on in my industry. You know, we, we have a guy named Robert Catherine. He's like, you're a filmmaker. <laughs> and, and he says every time he wanted to make a heroic sort of theme, he, uh, he's had these conversations with like, I don't, I can't remember. It's, it could have been an actor's guild, something saying we got to depict more LGBTQ or sure. you should be using this. And it's all contaminated. We have, we have a poet who's dealt with the same thing. And we're just trying to um, take the culture back. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much novelty in it. And I think that's why. Um, even at this early stage, a couple of, of left-leaning art writers have already contacted me to smear, but we didn't respond. You know, the council knows about this. <laughs> There's sure, some wild yeah. people, yeah. Yeah, I bet. They're coming yeah. after you, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the council deals with a lot less than me personally, actually, because mm -hmm. with me, you can attach a face. It's like, sure. he's, a, he's, a, he's a traitor to the Asian people, and he's, he should be a liberal and all this other crap. You know, there's a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, these these the these journalists these purveyors of culture, the thing is is they're trying to hold you accountable for your ideas, but who holds them accountable for their ideas? And that's the thing is that they they operate from the position that they have ideas that are that represent the end of history. We are in the privileged position to judge all other ideas. You know that's who we are. And so who are you? Who are you to be doing this thing that challenges us? And it's like. Well, hold on. No one ever holds them to account. And the reason why no one ever holds them account to account is because we don't have our own institutions yet. But, you know, when you hand over the institutions to people who didn't build them, you'll see what happens real quick. They start falling apart, right? Okay, have them. You can have them. Take the institutions. You didn't build them. You don't know how to run them anyway. And so... I, I mean, imagine if journalists was trying to pursue the truth, right? This is my point. Yeah. Journalists could be artists. Right? Don't get don't get utopian on. Yeah, me. I don't get utopian, but 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 this, this it's interesting <laughs> that you even use the word utopian. David Horowitz he wrote in his book Take No Prisoners that that there's two ways people look at history. There's there's obvious one where history repeats and you can avoid unnecessary suffering by the humility and appreciation of understanding culture, right? The other okay. one is this vague narcissism that we are the chosen people and we can create paradise on earth. 
because they don't believe in God, right? Oh. So, they, so, 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 and they inevitably become social deconstructionists, and inevitably the journalists they become those who who want to push a narrative based on their bias, but they call themselves unbiased. Like this is it's been mapped out. And this has happened depending on the medium at the time that was regarded as a journalist, right? The the, right. the people who are saying keeping keeping you up to date. <laughs> this is right. this has always been contaminated. And uh yeah, this is why I love guys like Tanner with chess and Jack, you know, and we need to create our own channels because frankly speaking, the left, you know, I I, I share this on stage and it's it's worth repeating that you look at the way conservatives want to win the fight. And I will first say that, like, I'm actually not a conservative. I'm an anarchist that votes right, right? But, but, but I will say that I, I support, I'm going to support the right today because they're going to keep the state further than the left ever would, right? They're going to try, they're gonna try anyway. <laughs> yeah, like, so yeah. They actually do it. Yeah, that's true. But, 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 but look at how they talk, Will. The right, they have all, they've stacked red pill evidence, data, they try to be stoic with just the data, and then they, ninety percent of the time, it goes into this echo chamber, and it circulates, and we just fortify each other. But it's not doing any real effective outreach. The young people are not looking at us with any uh, uh, enticement. The left, they don't even care about that. No, they don't. They don't care. They, they, they can't do the data thing on the table. They have ownership of the big five: big tech, academia, art gallery, Hollywood entertainment. So they're yeah. just going to influence everyone. While we are too busy saying, yeah, but we have the numbers. We need you guys, but we need to start coming into here. And, and the, moment, the moment conservatives understand ROI, return of investment, is not just capital and numbers on your back. It's actually controlling culture. Then we're going to start to become real players in the cultural landscape. Because that's also yep. another problem. Because we are capitalists, as we should be. And we are individually minded. And we are competitive. But we're too busy looking at our investments on how we can put more money in our pockets, which we should, mm -hmm. right? But the challenge with that in regards to arts is that's why the left is so effective in the culture because they, they actually have a more expansive view on investing, you know, because they're able to, con I mean, not to, I'm not saying they make more money, but, but they are in the culture today. They are the gatekeepers. You know yeah, what I mean? You're right. You're right. Yes. And, and we need to start, like, you're a filmmaker. I mean, like, did you, you know, I'm, and I'm speaking as an artist too, like, it's like seldom how, how we should be getting contacted at the same rate from people who have wealth on our side of the aisle. But you look at some liberal artists that, I, and I know many cases where they blend into their language and they get all this crazy funding. You know, <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. There, there. Yeah, you get it. Yeah. Well, this is. I'm going to issue a challenge right now. I mean, who knows who'll who'll see or hear this, but I'm going to issue a challenge, and it's like there. Are, I don't know how many tr genuine, you know, we'll say right wing, you know, right leaning, conservative, whatever millionaires and and billionaires. They they like they exist, obviously, right? Why aren't they funding? You know, why aren't they funding projects that represent their values? Why are they not contributing to artists such as yourself? Why aren't they openly starting up foundations? Why aren't they starting music studios? Why aren't they starting record labels? Why aren't they beginning engines of cultural creation? They're not, but we would know if they were. Very few And, are, the, and the wildest thing is, I, I, well, I've met some of these collectors that are on the right or are like wealthy Christian people like that are like big builders of churches, like, and they get artists from leftists, people who hate them because right. they, they're, just, they're just getting art. And uh, it's it's something that we need to we need to fix a disconnect, and and I'll I'll make that roll call um, part of my egocentricity. But I am on your show. I'm gonna say something. Do it. Full send. No half send. My man. This podcast. <laughs> uh -oh. well, 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 I want to, when I'm doing my biblical study, when I'm doing my excavation into the Bible. After a year of just talking to these 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 uh big brained. Christian heads, what yep. I would like to do is produce a magnum opus. And I need a wealthy patron for this. And, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and this is what I want. And, you know, look, already many artists envy my position because, like, I'm not, like, I don't have no yacht, right? But I'm in a position where 
Well, well, I make my living selling paintings and I have a collector yeah. base and I, I can, I'm fine where I am and I'm comfortable and I can continue doing so. But if we want to do some like huge uppercuts, the way the left does with their artists, their painters, like they do some crazy big blowout shows where they rent out, you know, giant spaces and, and, and they already pay the artists in advance. And, and it's, it's like, it's almost like it's those patrons projects. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, we need to do some of that. And absolutely. And, and the Genesis, this is bigger than me. The Genesis council has a lot of cats like that. You know, um, there's a lot of so much talent in there that, that they're trying to be righteous with their material, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know Cameron's Cameron's in there. I, I want to get to the Genesis. He's council. crushing it. He's, yeah. Continue. Yeah, dude, the guys, I mean, the guy has been, you know, I met that guy like in April earlier this oh, year. He's a beautiful he's, man. He's, beautiful human being. He's, he's, well, he's also he's, a member of the bald community. Also, I gotta get one of these so I can kind of match you, but I'm Asian, so it doesn't really like it. Just kind of comes out like speckled. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can just paint it on. No, so yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the, the, I, I think the reason why, and I'll, and I'll just say this: if we're right. issuing calls, the reason why more wealthy patrons on, we'll say, on the right, aren't funding engines of cultural production is because they're beta males. They are. Oh, I said it. No, yeah, I said yeah. it. Look, yeah, yeah, look. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. here's yeah. the thing. I know Here's what you're saying. Thing. Well, I mean, it's really convenient to espouse right-leaning ideas, right? Right up until the point where you begin to step on people's toes. And particularly once you begin to step on your wife's toes, you know, the women in your community. It's really good to talk about masculinity right up until the point where a woman says, uh-uh, I don't like that. But, you know, you got to... Whoa, whoa. <laughs> real, man. I just realized you're right. Yeah. Because I had a... Oof. Yeah. I had a commission three years ago from one of my collectors. Uh, this is uh, one of my, my, my uh, bigger collectors. He has a nice home in Reston, Virginia. His entire house is my art. It's, a, it's, an, it's an incredible, you uh, humbling in, thing. You have psychedelic experience of yourself. Like <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, well, first time I went over, I was like, this is after like four years of him collecting my art. I'm like, what the hell? This is, this is like super humbling, man. And I don't even want to talk, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, just because it's, it's 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 such a gesture, you know. Yeah, for, oh, for sure. I, on my journey, I get yeah. it. I get it. No, but but I I remember he he had this. Uh, he wanted to do this. Um, oh shit, maybe I shouldn't say this, but anyways, I don't think his wife likes me too much, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but but he makes some money, right? So and, much for that. <laughs> whatever. Uh, but, but 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 there's big <laughs> whatever. Uh, there, there's there's um it's reality. Fuck it. There's this big commission that he wanted from me, and. I, and I remember he once texted to me, I just got to check in with the wife. And I'm like, this is the first time he's ever said this. Sure. Yeah. And in my head, I'm like, this guy's got some real tech money, by the way. I'm like, you know, he probably frivolously spends on things other than art, like way more anyways. So art is just like another thing for him. You know what I mean? Sure. <laughs> it's the way he's, he's, he's at that, app, that position. And in my head, I was like, um, okay, that's fine. And then, but then, you know, a little bit later, he just, he just, the whole conversation we've been having, we've been talking about this commission for some time because it's like a big idea he has. It just suddenly ceased. And the last text he sent was, let me, let me talk to my wife about this. Sure. This is the problem. I mean, look, if, if, if you're being an alpha male, and, and I, I mean self actualized, we're not talking about muscle, tats, cars, and all right. the bullshit. <clears throat> right. If they you're being an alpha trying. male, yeah, if you're going to be a responsible man, yeah. You don't have to ask your wife for shit. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. You know, I mean, it, it sounds to me, it's like so often people meet my girl and they've heard me talk and they expect to see like this. this I don't know why, because they don't, I mean, I do know why. They, they don't, they haven't thought it through, but they expect to see this woman who's like afraid or something like that. Like, no, nah, <laughs> she's happier than you. And yeah. she's yeah. like, she's just having a blast and she's a very happy life. <laughs> yeah, she does. You, you met her, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's just a free bird. She's just being feminine girl. And she's like a girly girl now. She's just hanging out, always just, you know, getting her makeup, whatever, and and looking pretty for me. And then we just go out to dinner and and then I say, all right, good girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so there is there is something to there is something to what you're saying about um about you know, a man can ask for his wife's opinion. Asking yeah, for your yeah, wife's yeah. opinion is different from asking from your for your wife's permission. You know, and so I think a lot of men, 
you know, they're, they're willing to be masters of the masters of the universe at work. You know, you can make a lot of money in whatever industry you're in. You can be master of the universe with your dudes on the fishing boat on the weekend. But if you're not the master of the universe inside your own home and you, and you start really doing things that start crossing the big cultural red lines that live within all of our social relationships, including many of our romantic relationships, it's going to show up real quick in your unwillingness to really engage with the culture and, and really fight and really fight the battle. And I think there are just, wow. unfortunately, a lot of men, you know, who are just not willing to go that far with it. It's like, I don't really want to commit to this. It's like, well, it's going to cost you your kids, you know, it's going to yeah, cost you. Yeah. You, you know, it's, it's funny. Cause I, I often try to like, you know, as, as we all get busier, you just want to be more practical. And, and sure. one thing I often try to do is I try to look at things from a lens of, of circumstantial reality because it allows yeah. us to, uh, because because once you can understand reality circumstantially, you can start nesting things in their proper place where where the, the where the results you want will happen actually more automatically, right? Yeah. Because the context, the setup itself is is, is situated in a way where when things land upon it, it'll go into the right channel. Um, and the first thing is, if men find anything, any discipline that they enjoy more than sex women will naturally fall in the right place. That's right. And that, I don't care if that's painting. I don't care if that's jujitsu. I don't care if that's um, anything but, but video games and watching porn. Right. Like, <laughs> right. If you find Basically. any discipline you love more than having sex, the woman's going to realize, oh, this is no longer a bargaining chip. Oof. It's automatically. She's not going to be able to articulate that, but it's, it's a situation where often when men go on dates, they say, hey, uh, what do you have to put on the table? And what the woman has a table here, sex, boom. Sure. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So, they, so don't if, to, if, they don't even have to say it. They just know it. Yeah. And, and it's almost where it's like, if you're like, well, you know, um, great, but like, what else is there to put into the picture, right? I got here's painting the thing, to I, do. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, got, yeah. I, got a, I got I got paintings to make. And, you know, th- there's this, you know, there's, there's two ways to get pleasure. And all these, so many different religious schools talk about this. This is another universality that I've noticed. You know, whether you're such an, studying the Kabbalah, even the Quran, as violent and and based on martyrdom they are, they at least acknowledge this too, which is that sure. you can get pleasure of the body, good food, sex. Uh, they're usually short term, but they're there, and they should be enjoyed in the right context naturally. But you can get pleasure. The deeper sort is the assertion of a skill, mm, mastery, mastery. Yeah. When you walk out of a mat after a hard practice and you know you had a good practice because you earned that moment and you remember the hours associated with that and your feet are dragging as you leave this dojo, you're like, oh my God, this is mm-hmm. life. Or, or when, I, when, I first, when I got one of my first solo exhibitions and the buildup associated with that, and, it, and I don't care, at that time, my art wasn't at the, at the same price point, but still the fact that I made those sales and, and, and the pride you get from that, yeah. it's not an ego thing. It's a deserve. You sacrifice and you earned it. The mastery of a skill. This, this, that journey is, I live for that. Mm-hmm. Like I really live for that. And I try to make my life about that. And that's incredibly sexy to a woman, number one, because you're mm-hmm. a creator. You know, if a man is a creator, and a, and a builder, you're, you're pretty much attractive, you know, de facto. But also, um, most men are, to a degree, addicted to sex. And mm-hmm. a woman is a drug dealer using her, her sexuality and her holes as like, and selling it to you like, like, a, like a drug addict. You can't get trapped and, in that. Yeah. She's, yeah, yeah, she's yeah, addicted yeah, yeah. to it herself as well. You know, she's, addi- yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's that component now in culture, but please continue. No. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this is what I, this is what I realized, you, you know, you know, with, uh, you know, I, I even, um, look, cause I had a phase where I thought I, I, you know, I was compensating and hooking up with these different girls, trying to get the most beautiful girl and, and they looked great yeah. and all whatever it was, but man, it, it it really doesn't go that far. And it's almost like, I almost want to tell them like, okay, I wouldn't recommend it, but go have it. You know, like mm-hmm. being, being an artist at that time, 
I'm 21 and I'm showing at galleries where usually people twice my age show. Yeah, I had a plenty of options. Mm-hmm. You know, you go into the space and then all those skinny blonde European bitches that are into the artists like that, that's fine. That's a beautiful thing. But, you know, there, there it's like, I would much rather have a girl now yeah. who may not be at the same um, nine or 10, but, you know, like, like a good looking girl who understands and honors and respects me and is a ride or die. She's willing to fucking mm-hmm. fall on the sword for me a thousand times. Mm-hmm. And if you could find, like, 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 like there's women there that have been raised properly and who understand the value of a good man and they will fucking die for you. Mm-hmm. Like, like, <laughs> I don't, not, not, probably not like the I way men were, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you yeah. mean. Yeah. Like, if you, if you meet a, because, you know, women are, are programmed to not be loyal and, uh, under certain circumstances, and if you can find a woman under certain cer- under certain circumstances, yes, that's the, that's the whole hypergamy computer thing, right? Like, yeah, 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 ex- yeah, extreme yeah, circumstances, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Women have hypergamous instincts, but but a woman who recognizes that that is wrong and she can actually articulate that is yeah. incredibly rare, and that's that's such a rare thing. It's scarce, and it's to me, it's more scarce than a fucking doctor. That's that's a chick and any of that crap. Right. So right. so so. And, it, to be yeah. fair, a lot of like that's women's instincts, and a lot of men aren't so great at following anything beyond their instincts either. Like it's yeah, it, that's true. To, yeah, so it's like I don't want it to seem like only women have trouble. Like there are plenty of dudes. You know, that's the scene. Have you seen that's Dune true. yet? That, have you seen that movie? Oh my god, uh, I okay. have to, okay. man. I'm, I'm okay. it's terrible. No, well, haven't. anyway, there's a there's a famous scene where you know Paul Atreides, you know, the hero was supposed to stick his hand in this box, and there's a woman with a needle against his neck, and if he takes his if he takes his hand out of the box, he dies, and the box has really intense pain in it. It's a really cool scene. And it gets down to that whole the whole issue, like, are you able to control your own reaction to your instincts? And that's something that humans struggle with. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and so I don't want it to seem like women are the only ones who struggle against their instinctual nature, like men do as well. It just shows up differently in, in, in different contexts. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I, I think it's almost like they need to religiously understand and endure that that teenage, richly defined, excessively horny, where you just want to fuck everything face. Yes. And, and, and then just understand, like, women aren't meant to be put on a pedestal, and they're not meant for power. They they don't handle power well. It's just a reality, and especially over men. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 crazy, man. Like, I I think my this is segues to a a deeper point about the manosphere actually, which is that I, I shared on stage that my biggest issue with a lot of the manosphere, and I understand it's like you said, it's 15 years of baggage was that I understand we do need to pick up artists for teaching men social skills and to, and to not be intimidated about approaching women and not feel like, like, like they can control you emotionally and you're, you're not a puppet to their whims. Mm-hmm. That definitely has a place. And, and, and but my, my my issue is that they're still defining their masculinity by the opposite sex in their own brain. Yeah. And what matters is here. So yeah. you can get your dick wet here. Yeah, 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 here too. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, you, you you can get your 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 uh your rocks off all day, but at the end of the day, it's um you're a man based on the validation from the opposite sex. And that is a factor in regards to understanding where you are in the, in the pecking order of sexual attraction. But that isn't a factor in regards to what determines your masculinity itself. Women mm-hmm. should not even matter in that regard. I mean, I mean they, they should in regards to right. family and all this, but, but in regards to like, like, look at a monk. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Or look at a mm-hmm. serious artist. Like, what are they doing? Like, a man has to become good at something, right? You have to be a, 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 a man of a set of skills that allows you to become like this, like this archetypal character. Mm-hmm. And we almost have to act that out and become that in real life, uh, like a superhero. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a, man, a, a man has to figure out what he is, and a woman is, is just born as she is. Mm-hmm. It's a very mm-hmm. different circuitry. And, very much. And if you're looking at, if you're asking a woman, how to become a man and you're defining her by that it's 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 impossible it's like me it's like a fish asking how are you gonna it's like 
It's like you asking the fish, how do I, how should I catch you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I just, I just, I just feel so confused because when I talk to those, I, I, I spoke to some of those guys, right. At the summit. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm respectful because I understand their role and, and, and what it took to, you know, the evolution behind it. But, but man, it's, it's like their existence is based on the opposite sex. Many. Right? Yes. So it's like, it's like um, the, the feminine psyche is, is their Lord. That's Jesus for them. For many of the men in the manuscript. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And, 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 that's, and that's a problem because yeah. if, I guarantee you if they found their artistic medium, this is something that like, I really don't think they understand. Is it like, this is not artists, and this is probably something we talk about. Artists are not these like feminine people that are losers that grow up their hair like emos and, and they just dwindle their little brushes or whatever medium you want to talk about. Right. An artist is a, is, is a person who's able to get all, everything that is of value to them and also have the aesthetic ability to distill it and to share it. And it's, it's, you're like a magician. You know, you you become a magician, that whole archetype. And I think it's important that um, if if a man finds a discipline that he can really dedicate a lot, his life to and get that high, like it's like a runner's high or, or whatever you want to call it, get that high of a discipline, you're not going to be so obsessed with sexuality because you're going to realize just by time management alone, how am I going to get, how am I going to get, be able to master the skill, which is going to take well beyond 10,000 hours. You know what I mean? And to create my voice on top of that and the fact that people are giving me real respect in regards to that. Like, so it's hitting at every level. How am I going to, um, like just competing to try to this body count thing is going to take you away from that. That's time you can be putting into a mastery of, of an artistic ability. And so many of the Genesis council members actually are these studs who are like, yeah, you know, it's like, there's two axes in there. They're like, they, they're like these like Brad Pitt looking motherfuckers. And they're like, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's odd because everyone thinks I'm just fucking everything that moves, but like, I mean, and, and I've, I've actually hung out with one of them and yeah, like, like girls are always walking up to them and he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist first. And mm -hmm. I was able to understand that position. I mean, I'm a four, so I don't understand it as much, but I know what they're talking about because I, <laughs> I used to, have, because I used to Stop. have, I used to have like these little groupies actually. Like, like at one, at one point, but I know what they're talking about. It's like, am I, am I an artist of the soul or the ego? And, and it's something that's, that sounds so meta, but if you're really doing it, then, then you know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. as a creative person listening, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, the, the, gosh, there's so much I can say in response to that. Where, where do I jump in? Okay. Here's what, here's what happens first. Okay. So what happens first, here's the thing with the manosphere. The Manosphere was born out of the pickup artist movement. And the pickup artist movement was entirely about, you know, what it does on the tin. It's about picking up women. Out of the pickup artist movement came the red pill stuff, you know, that this giant sociological experiment that was the pickup world, the forums and stuff. Here's what works with women. Here's what doesn't work with women. Wait a minute. This doesn't line up with what we're being told by, you know, culture about women. Oh my gosh, everything is a lie. And so the red pill was born out of that. And then men started getting into the red pill thing and they recognized that. You know, the real way to win at this game is not to play and you focus on yourself instead of, uh, instead of on, on women, right? And so that's what the manosphere came out of. All these different subjects, these, all these different streams being crossed about different aspects of how to cultivate masculinity in order to not have to focus on getting laid. It's sort of like, you know, it's, it's sort of like we're going to do as the central focus, right? Like, okay, so you focused on yourself and you developed yourself and getting laid is a secondary thing, but you need the social skills and the, and the skills to be able to do that, right? So that's kind of the manosphere. This kind of like hodgepodge of different ideas that have all kind of crossed in this kind of watering hole, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or, or fountainhead, whatever of ideas that are all coming together. Here's the problem that the manosphere is facing. The manosphere doesn't know how to talk about character. What does it mean to be a man of character? It doesn't know how to have that conversation yet, yet it's getting there. It's getting there with the notions of religious, uh, the religion coming in with Michael Foster and stuff like that. But once you start talking about aspects of character, you start getting to this notion of it's one thing to cultivate my fitness and my style and, and to cultivate you know, my, my social abilities and to have an understanding of the sociopolitical landscape and preparedness and sovereignty and all that stuff. 
But character is inner cultivation. What you do not find in the manosphere are techniques and practitioners of true inner cultivation. That was 30 years ago in the mythopoetic men's movement, King Warrior, Magician Lover, Iron John, mm. techniques of inner transformation. That's the world that I came from. And the difference between the Renaissance and the Manosphere is that the Renaissance include this total totality of process includes the 40 year period, the, all the 40 years of it includes the mythopoetic men's movement. So what's happening is you went to the Renaissance into the pickup or in, sorry, the mythopoetic men's movement into the pickup era into the red pill era, into the manosphere, into the sovereignty movement. And the totality of that is the Renaissance. That's what the Renaissance of men is. And so these ideas about inner transformation are now just slowly beginning to come back into this world of men because we're recognizing that we've solved a lot. We've figured a lot of things out that are going on outside of ourselves. Now, how do we begin working on what's going on inside ourselves and become men of character and mm. substance? That's the phase that we're going into individuation young talks about yes. this yes. You, you, you know it's uh again it's all it's all it's all mental and what you're acknowledging is the inner fight and the, I, and i believe that the, um like the, honestly the 21 year summit and 21 summit that you know we just spoke at man like that was a it was probably the least pick up the outside world validating yeah, you know, um, twenty one. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, needless to say, almost you know, all, all the like you said, the religious men. It's almost like we're bringing back the wisdom of the ancients that men are supposed to uphold when they are passed when when the torch is being passed to them just by being born with the male genitalia. That's right. You know, and uh. Yeah, I'm all you're speaking my language with the archetypal stuff, man. Mm -hmm. You know, for real. When you have all the when you have everything in your outer life sorted, meaning, okay, congratulations, you know, you've got a successful career. Congratulations, you've got a fit body. Congratulations, you've got a you've got a happy marriage and you've got, you know, some number, you know, more than one kids. You have it all. But there's always more. Meaning there's always, um, there's always a way that you can cultivate yourself as a man into something even greater without needing to change a thing externally. And that's, yeah. that's character. And that's truly the fulfillment of men and masculinity. And we're getting there. We're definitely well, getting I, there. I think that was a value. Actually, both yourself and Sean Smith touched that, I think, strongest. I love Sean. You know, it, 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 yeah, he's dangerous, by the way. He's in a good dangerous. way, yeah. He's, yeah, super, he's super deadly. Yeah. He's a sniper. Uh, yeah, he's a sniper. Um, but I think both of your speeches uh, really touched upon the inner transformation that is that should be that should be the focus, man. I, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to say should, but 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 I, I, know I, what you I mean. yeah, but but it's it's almost like you see this fountain here. You know, it's it's like you see a fountain, like you said. It's like the fountain pours water from the inside out. And it's like the inner source. And mm -hmm. we're looking at all these sprinkles and, and focusing on the externalities again, when we should be focusing on our inner source first. And then once you develop the character and the wisdom, then all that other stuff will actually will fall in its more proper place. And we, mm -hmm. and, and we won't get um, like this bodybuilding image as what a man is. Right. Or, or you, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like we need to be physically strong, you know. We hear you, Elliot Holtz. Like, but that's important. But, but, but that's a role, just like any other part has a role to be holistic. Again, focus on, don't focus on perfection. Focus on wholeness, mm -hmm. you know. And, and th this, this is a, this is a big thing for me. And that's why I'm always pushing to art things so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because in art, you have to humble yourself. Like, I don't care how many push-ups you can do. You got to render this with your mind. Yes. It's true. You know? <laughs> but, but there are men that do need to get better doing push-ups. And I think it can be, That's true. There, can be, there can be the need for a lot of men that have their outside life squared away, even in really positive ways, to always have inner work to do. As, as uh, Arthur Dane, Blood and Rain, wrote on his Instagram a few days ago, heal your bloodline. There's always work to be done for that. Like, you know what I, I mean? Arthur. That's right. Love that guy. <laughs> 
So the, some some men, you can you can be completely squared away and still have to do that work. And I think a lot of really smart men would acknowledge that. You know what? There's still stuff from my childhood that I need to sort out. Even though I've got, you know, I've got the bank account, I've got the wife, I've got the family, there's still stuff inside that I can sort out. And at the same time, I think that there are men that are more comfortable doing the inner work that frankly need to get under a barbell, you know, that, that do need to do the outer work as well. You, you, you got to do a full spectrum dominance, Scott, man. That's right. You, you got to hit it all. You, you know, it's, it's funny you said that, man. One of the members of the 20, uh, who, uh, audience members who came to the summit, he actually came to see three speakers and, and I was really grateful. One, one was me. And, and it turns out he was in New York and he says, I would love to have you come for dinner. I sit down with him and he's got, he's so much going on, all this beautiful gadgets and money and all this. But he told me, like, listen, like, um, I attended to acknowledge it in a work like you're talking about. So you can have all this stuff, but, but I really think it's about like, everything is in man. Everything's in your head. This is all in your head right now. You know what I mean? Not to be all psychedelic, but, but we have to, in regards to values, and in regards to nesting them and grounding them in the right hierarchy, right? That's right. And, and it, it, that allows you to know what to stand up for, what's the degree associated with it, when to throw hands and when to be users, your, 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 your knowledge. I mean, it, it, there's just so many factors, but I think we have to focus on going within, man. And I think that solves so much. And, hmm. and, and this is why, this is why I'm, uh, I've, took the stance in the art game because the, you know, we'll call them whatever you want. The radicals, I guess we'll just culminate them as that term. They've really destroyed what I love. You know, I love mm -hmm. art. I became an artist because I was a religious kid and I was really attracted to this idea of there being like a spiritual order. That's just a part of reality. And the more we, we, diverge from this reality, the more life becomes chaotic and people are unhappy and, and unsupportive and lack direction and it cannot connect with one another. And just the fact that there is this idea of a spiritual hierarchy, I was attracted to this. And I go into this industry that wants to throw that all into the trash. So I'm, I'm now trying to stand up for men. I'm trying to stand up for the good word, the good news, and all things that point us towards, you know, giving us the strength towards the good. And yeah, that, that's what my position now has been in the art game. And it's, it's funny because on one hand, I'm completely independent. So I'm free of those constraints now. But on the other, I can see that. Like they're still, I don't, they might be, they're just like losers. They still are bothering me. Like it's, it's crazy. No, I mean, it's not because I'm bothered, but like, I get I like, I still get things like notifications from like social media, people saying your account, some a couple people reported you again. And it's just, it's, it's, it's got to get to a point where this is very lofty, but it's got to get to a point where the stuff that we're talking about becomes mainstream, which will be very difficult, but it has to get to that point. Otherwise, they have nothing but, I mean, the, the people have nothing but ideological subversion. Mm -hmm. They'll have nothing but to be under the umbrella of demoralization, you know, mm -hmm. until this becomes a part of the, the more mainstream discourse. So it's, it, the setups have to be out in front in public like you. You're doing this. It's going to be on YouTube. It's out there. Chess, you're going out with the chess. We have to be public. And I could have kept my mouth shut and keep going up the ladder. And eventually, and, and I, I would never let them physically compromise if I, as I've seen some artists get into that position. But I wouldn't even let them ideologically do it. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not like some control freak or uninclusive person. But, but what you're, you, you come to this realization that we got to be public, man. And the only reason why things are this bad is because good men who know what's right in their heart are not speaking up. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Well, you, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned some about your art. And so there's a reason why 
Uh, I wanted to have you on as my first guest on the Renaissance of Men video version of the podcast so that we can actually get a chance to dig into some of your art in a visual medium, which would be far easier to do on YouTube than it would be on a podcast. So uh, right you, I don't know if you want to if you want to click on a couple of your paintings and uh, let's yeah, talk yeah. about how, some I, of these, how, the, how it manifests in your work. Yeah, um, I compiled some of the uh, my most notable works that won the Artist of the Year in 2020. That some of them were produced during the Eileen S. Kaminsky Family Foundation. And some of them um, are in good collections now. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't, I sh I'm supposed to ask them first. Um, anyways, we'll go through some of these. Matters. So, so here's just, one that- Just can I ask a quick question about what it means to have your art owned by private collectors? Can you, like, if you want to go, like, look at your own painting, do you, like, email the owner, like, hey, can I just come over and, like, look at this thing I created? Like, what are your visitation yeah, if I, rights? If I want to see it in person, yeah, I, I would have to, like, set it up because some of these people are, they, to be affiliated with certain types of collection, uh, it's basically, it's a huge, huge amount of faith and investment that they basically, there's, there's money associated with it as well. But sure. basically, if a person has, like, Basquiat's, Warhols, like these, these notable names, um, even though there's some dirty money associated with some of them. But anyways, my point is that the, the, the reputation at that high art world, to, if you have some of those notable people, it's one thing to say, I have an art collection. Well, but usually when a person says, you know, you're a part of the, uh, the Bailey collection or, or um, you know, like, you know, like the, it's a real collection. It's because it's this notable artist. And if they're going to put up my art in association with these names, it, it, it's a huge validation in the art world. Now, mm -hmm. what I'm doing speaks for itself, in my opinion, which is why in silence, I was getting all this veneration. But um, the, some of the works I'm going to show you are a part of collections, actually. Got it. So Break this it one's down, titled, man. this one's, oh, thank you, bro. This one's titled Agony and Ecstasy. And what we see here are two central, this is a little bit more of an obvious deep dive into symbolism because it's really just two central types of figures. And one is the Virgin Mary and the other is the guardian Chinese food dog. And on, um, you know, a lot of the color palette at this stage of my career was deeply influenced by Leonid Afrimov who's in a way like a modern Fovis. And a lot of what I'm trying to do, you know, often when you add too much color, it makes it less intellectual. But the reason why I'm doing so is because I'm trying to, like the colors, not the mark making, but the colors have like the saturation that implies like a pop art sensibility. And I'm doing that because I was trying to make wisdom like a sexy or something, make young people mm. be attracted to it. So because a big bridge is, is in art, in the arts is making young people attracted to um, the message you're trying to denote. You know, if you can do that, that's a big gap. So that was, that's kind of why I have this, this deep dive into color. But as my language is developing, I'm doing less. Um, a lot of the things I'm working on is going to have not as intense colors. But at this stage, I was really into trying to make things hyper intense and, and uh, uh, hyper real, you know. Psychedelic at that too. And, and juxtaposing these figures, you know, I spoke about this at 21 a little bit. What, what do you think putting these two figures together implies, Will? Um, masculine and feminine? Yeah. Um, so, so the guardian food dog is, is actually a symbolic image in <clears throat> symbolic sculpture in East Asian culture. And it represents defending family cohesion mm. so they're given by elders usually and that's why every time you go to like i'm not chinese i'm korean but whatever same shit when you go to a lot of <laughs> you all look the same to me yeah we all the same when you go to east asian <laughs> people's homes they usually place that in front of their homes and the elders usually give it to them mm. it's a way of saying you purchase a new home you're about to start a family we're gonna we're gonna protect and honor it and they gave you the statue it's a beautiful gesture and mm. And it's so odd that the external aesthetic is so different when, when the statue of the Virgin Mary is trying to say something of the same sort, which is defend the mother and the child 
Mm. Right. And, 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 you know, every time you see the Virgin Mary depicted, she's articulated so youthfully because mm. the idea that a woman and a child are actually very innocent. I don't, you know, regardless of like just their psychological nature, they are creatures of innocence. So there are things to be defended and preserved. So when you stack these two together, it's exploring that sentiment that the society that does not defend and preserve the mother and the child falls into hell. And that's why there's a fiery tone to it and imbued to it as well. And this is kind of the language I was exploring with this painting that men have to understand that those Mongol son of, son of bitches are coming this way and the women and children go this way and we go this way. That's the deal. And that is mm-hmm. a part of masculinity historically. We need to understand that those mandates will never leave us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, how old were you when you painted this? What stage in your career was this? Because you said at this stage in your career, what, how long ago was that? Oh, this is pretty recent still, but, but it, it's, it's okay. like, um, like early 2019. Okay. So, so it's still pretty recent, but uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just trying to remember. Um, I think this is late 2018 or early 2019. Okay. Um, yeah, but, but, but it was 2018, 2019. But, okay. but, 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 the, but the, the colors are really what's distinct at, at my evolution of my, of my painting voice at this point. I mean, that, was three, that was three years ago, which is yeah. kind of a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, brother, let me, let me show you this next one here. Hold on, can I ask a couple more questions? About sure, 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 sure. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, as, a, as a viewer, so one of the things that I really wanted to do, okay, so where my Poetry for Men podcast episodes came from was that I, was, I wanted to have an art appreciation component to my podcast, but it's very difficult to do art appreciation in terms of painting through an audio podcast, you know, and plus, what do I know about visual arts appreciation? It was something that I was looking forward to doing, to studying, but poetry I found was far more accessible. But from one of the things that I've been really interested in is, you know, obviously I can't get in touch with Michelangelo and say, Michelangelo, walk me through this painting. You know, what do you like about it? You know, what, what sort of things are you proud of about it? Because obviously he's passed away, but now I have an actual fine artist sitting here, you know, in front of me with his art up. And so I guess, I guess uh, just kind of walk me through the painting, like from a visual architecture standpoint, like how did it come together? Did you know that this was what you were doing? You know, were you like, no, I actually want to uh, uh, explore these themes or did you just start painting and you re- kind of realize I like that figure. I want to start pairing it with contrast. Like how did it come about visually? And then, you know, what am I supposed to look at? Cause I know that there's a, there's a language in terms of the way my eye is supposed to move around the painting, right. To touch mm-hmm. on all the different aspects. Like, how does that come about? You know, what, what, what path is my eye supposed to take? Like break down the architecture of it is what I'm kind of looking for. Whoa, that's a heavy load of question. So okay. <laughs> I didn't mean it to be. Oh, no, beautiful. Uh, so it's important that when you are developing your own style and, and your artistic voice, you need to have heavy um, disciplinary side to it. And, and what I mean by that is everyone looks at, the artistic process as this loose miasmic free flow uh, people who don't understand art they think it's all just like it's this creative channel man i just wake up and lightning strikes right. and i uh, and, and it's actually um the foundation there's actually the formulaic side too you put in your studio mechanical hours you go into your studio every day from those hours and what i do is i have a system <clears throat> i have a sketchbook i draw everything out first so the actual figures that I choose is based on a lot of study and it's a more contextual side. And then I draw all of them out. I have stacks of sketchbooks. They, they go up to my height. Wow. This is just from years. I have so many sketchbooks and this is just from drawing, drawing, drawing. And once I've kind of planned compositions that work for me, then I enter the canvas, but I don't, the, the experimental phase is actually in the color and the mark making. But the figures themselves, the outline, the, the ex- facial expressions, the angle that their chin is at, the, the direction they're looking, that's kind of just me stacking it and drawing it in a way that they're kind of, they're, they're mapped out. But mm-hmm. it's, it's funny that we earlier were talking about men should focus on who they are from the inside out and, and we were exploring that idea. That is the key to art making too. You should always first focus on the positioning, the essence of it, and then build the proportions and articulate it, then add the color harmonies and the values based on that. 
it's a, that's, that's a similar system. Where that's, and I, I follow that same classical Renaissance methodology. Mm-hmm. I get the positioning first. And then once they're all mapped out in a way that I feel like it's aesthetically on point, then that's when I get, that's when I'm playing actually. Mm-hmm. That's when I dive into this, this kaleidoscope of colors. And I, I go into a different headspace where I'm looking at the world based on how red would make me feel or what, what would happen mm-hmm. if blue is here. And what is the spectrum of emotionality that I can convey based on the symbolism? And how am I going to enunciate the symbolism with this color harmony? So that's when it gets into the uh, more uh, difficult to explain space because it's more intuitive, but you're feeling it there. It's almost like you're asking. Uh, it's like how does something taste? I can articulate it, mm-hmm. but it sometimes gets hard to render some of those um, uh, sushi dishes. <laughs> sure, yeah. What does the color red? What does the color yeah, red yes, taste yes, like? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's, there's that element as well, but that's the fun stuff because yeah. the whole process of art is expanding your set of disciplines as order onto this domain of chaos, right? That's what you're doing. You're, you're mapping it out. You're putting the, the mystery of this, of this imagery. That's, that's like a deity, like a deity, that deity, right? You're putting it onto a canvas and then you're, you're building and sculpting it out. And then there's experiment going on with it. It's a synergy, right? Mm-hmm. Of discipline, the skill set, and the technique. And I'm also playing with the experimental. Mm-hmm. Color harmony, situational, uh, mark making. Uh, I'm often, I also do a lot of spontaneous stuff. Like there's stages where I just decide to just throw paint and see how it lands. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to use that explosive quality to, to map out a different part of the plane. So, mm. so there's stages to it. It's very complicated because my paintings are also multi-layered. They're multi-layered. Uh, some, some painting styles are actually, frankly, easier. But, mm-hmm. it, but it, in my approach... There's no choice just by the dry time alone <laughs> to, right. to, 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 to build it up in its cake. And also something you can't see about my paintings, they're thick with three C's. Like yeah. they're, they're dimensional. Like, like, <laughs> three like, C's. like, yeah, yeah. It's like a, it's like a thick, like thick, I don't know, like girl in music video. There's like this orange, the orange part of the, of the woman up there, like that's yeah. actually popping out. And one thing that a lot of my collectors have often contacted me about was the ones who have put their artwork on the next to the window, when the sunlight hits it, they actually see these deep shadows coming mm. to the side because it's so thick. It's caked. So they mm-hmm. see the ridges. And I love that because yeah. I want them to feel it in three-dimensionally. My paintings have a three-dimensional relief feeling to them because they're actually thick. Like they come out mm-hmm. a little bit. And it's hard to see in person. I mean, it's, it's hard to see on screen. Yeah. But, but they're... They're layered with dimensionality. That's the genius of Van Gogh, right? Like you'll see sunflowers oh or something God. like that's insane. It's like, what the heck is going on? Everyone wants to say it's a right cliche now. thing when people say, "Who are your top painters?" And on that list is Van Gogh. But of course, I, I got to say, you have to see his work in person. Yeah, you can see like a sunflower painting. You go, okay, it's a sunflower, but you see it in person, and you can smell the oils. By the way, you can mm-hmm. smell the oils, and you feel mm-hmm. your brain chemistry changing as you smell the oils. It's just like. This is a, a, a mind altering moment. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he painted so thick. And when I saw some yeah. of those impressionists, I said, okay, I'm ready. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a thing, man. We have, we have been deprived in our, in our culture, our, our contemporary culture of the true experience of the beauty of the beauty of a political or depoliticized art. To experience, you know, the sunflowers, or to experience some of Monet's water lilies that went to this uh, museum in Japan on the Seto Inland Sea, uh, the Benes Art House, I think is what it's. No, it's not the Benes Art House. It's it's, it's in that on that same island, the the island of uh, Naoshima, and there's this gigantic display of these enormous paintings of Monet's water lilies and yeah. the entire the entire in, inside of this museum it's all designed by this you know very famous uh, Japanese architect Tadao Ando and so the, the the museum itself is gorgeous and then you to see water lilies you you have to take off your shoes and they, they you put on these little wow. little booties little socks right and you walk on this 
marble tiled floor into this room that's like it's like 20 feet hall high white marble with this giant skylight and natural light floods in and then there's this 20 foot by 10 foot painting of water lilies in front of you and it's just like wow. looking like god in the face it's just the most beautiful profound thing it was, it was truly divine one of the most incredible experiences i've ever had and you know you don't have to know anything about impressionism or art history to appreciate mm-hmm. that you can look at it purely for its aesthetic beauty and be blown away and yet we're deprived of that in our world. And that's what real art should do. Uh, it's right. really important. One thing I want to, one of my goals often is to dismantle the, the elitism in the art world where it's like, oh, sure. you need this education with this theoretical knowledge. No, art hits the soul. Art hits the gut. You yeah. know, I, I always tell people, I don't care about your background. I don't care about whatever identity you want to label yourself as. Go to some foundations and go to some museums. Don't go to galleries because they are inevitably woke today. There are a lot of good galleries. But, right. but, but the chances are lower. Go to museums. Go look yeah. at where the history of artists too. Go to museums. Go to foundations. And go look at some damn art. And, then, right. and then get some damn art on your walls on top of that. And then the, right. you're going to be blown away. That's right. That's why yeah. I really wanted to dig into your paintings. Because it's like I want men to be able to have some hook that draws them into a piece of art so that they know how to look at it. Because you can look at something, you can say the colors of it are beautiful or like the figures or whatever. But if you can have an appreciation of just even one small detail of the technical, of some technical or philosophical notion behind art, it can absolutely transform your appreciation of art, poetry, like to learn chord progressions. Like if you learn how to play guitar for like a couple months and you learn chord progressions and then you hear chord progressions in pop music or whatever you listen to, it'll change your appreciation of music entirely. And so it's that it did for me. And so like, I want men to have the same experience of visual art of painting because it can transform your life. It can transform your mind and your heart to be able to appreciate beauty on a deeper level. 100%. It's, it's an important, it's, it's, if you're going to be, have a holistic masculinity, you need the aesthetics. Absolutely. You need the aesthetics. And Miyamoto Musashi talks about this in the book of five rings that every warrior to be a complete warrior I mean, he, he's essentially saying a man, but you know, his, his whole lens was warrior, warrior, warrior mm-hmm. is, uh, is you need to pick up a brush and practice calligraphy or poetry. Mm-hmm. A- and he's right about that. You need to have brush on one hand and sword on the other, yeah. you know, that you need, you need that balance. And a lot of the guys like yourself, Tanner and I, Jack, I mean, like we're, we're Jack, we're acknowledging that we've got to take the aesthetics by the horns and That's right. It's, it's no coincidence. I, I got to tell you, like when I meet, me, I, I'll tell you some of, most of my collectors, and we're going to touch about this a little bit later, they're, uh, they're in the military. They're mm-hmm. warriors. Yeah. And it's because they, un- they, and they understand aesthetics at such a deep level because they've had to embody some type of masculine archetype in real life. And now they almost have a calling to explore that in other dimensions. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think they're, it's it's not a coincidence to me. Not at all. You want to no. look at this next piece, brother? Let's hit it. Ugh, so good. Thank By the way, for people who are listening on the podcast and aren't currently watching on, on YouTube, I'll make sure to provide some sort of link so you can get some sort of even if low res version so you can see what we're looking at. You can click in the yeah, show notes. This, this, like this, is, this is one of my capstones uh, in yeah. my career. And, it's incredible. and I, I plan to outdo this one, but I hope, I mean, but this is, this was, uh, it's funny, like what, I have a couple of mentors, Jeff Huntington, um, world-class muralist. Bill Newman was one of my mentors too. They all call it different things like peak performance. That's what he calls it. Another one calls it your mojo. When things Whoa. just line up, yeah, flow, um, things just line up perfectly and it just comes out like butter. Mm-hmm. Uh, now this took me forever, but I never lost my endurance when I produced this over several months Mm -hmm. and it just came together. Like it it was, it was my, um, I had so much inspiration being attracted to this idea of archetypal aesthetic in history. And, and believe it or not, this is, this was, a a same timeframe as the previous agony next year. It's called, very presumptuously, I titled it All and Everything. Now, obviously, there's not all and everything. 
but right. it felt like that for me to produce because it was this this is an assiduous one in regards to labor and and, and exercising my brain and focus i got i got tired of quite a bit too i mean wow. i was able to complete it at, at the rate that i planned to do so but it was it was heavy mentally to produce mm-hmm. this painting mm-hmm. i believe it i believe it i mean like i'm looking at all the different the different representations of various pieces of art, the various statues that I recognize. There's Venus de Milo in there. Um, you know, you've got the Michelangelo's David, or at least a representation of it. Like you, yeah. you had to, you had to absorb. You've got, a, I see a Buddha up there. You know, you've got yeah. how many different cultures are you working with? You got, a, I see, I think that's a dragon. You know, you're working, in, and a, I think a, is that a lamb that's in the um, towards yes. the center? Yeah. So, so, so. All of the figures you named, there, there's nothing random about any of this. Sure. All the figures at the top are either celestial figures or things to be cherished and protected. Okay. And in the middle are, is where the polarity is being sort of in battle. The mm. warriors, Beowulf, the medieval knights, the gods at war, and at the bottom is the underworld. We have Yamantaka, Medusa. We have the double face the incantation of female death. We have uh, the phoenix, the Slavic phoenix in the bottom kind of rising up. And mm-hmm. all the way on the other side above the phoenix is a sort of Damocles. So these are mm-hmm. all like really symbolically placed as a hierarchy, actually. Mm-hmm. And I did this on purpose. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to really convey that compositional awareness is, is connected to like psychological awareness. And, and I wanted to show that in a painting. And I've seen people do this in films, but I want to show that same illustration with uh, the visual arts. Mm-hmm. Wow. See, that, that, that single key to the image just opened up several new dimensions of appreciation for being able to look at it, to understand the, the hierarchy of, I guess, ascendance as you go up the painting. Yes, brother. That's great. That's great. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, th- this, this one was uh, like, I've actually had several collectors contact me about this one and mm. i'm just holding off to sell it because i can tell that the value will go up but i also can also tell that i mean i'm telling you this is a painting that i mean this is my baby actually <laughs> yeah, yeah. i see it on the wall behind you <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right this is my baby right here this is uh yeah. I, I i always leave this up here and it's it's a big one too you know yeah man yeah like Michael Jordan posting, putting a, one of his Nike ads on his own wall to remind him of, of who he's capable of being, right? Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm very vain. <laughs> I don't see that. <laughs> I'm just, All right, uh, uh, this one is actually my most popular painting, though. Okay. This one is titled Apex. Uh, can I read you a, a free writing exercise that we did on the council about this that Jeff Younger wrote? Yes. So, um, of course, my phone, I had it here ready, but mm, of course okay. it uh, flips. Okay, this, it, it's, it's, it's pretty beautiful. I was touched at, um, the tiger is hungry. He thirsts from the long run. The prey, a large buck, stands unknowing, filling its belly with green grass. A spirit overtakes the tiger. His eyes burn bright. His lips curl and show his fangs as saliva drips down his chin. Practice for the death bite before he feasts. The spirit of the hunter fills the tiger's bones and heart. Ambush and ruthless exploitation of surprise. The samurai had never seen a tiger on the hunt. He was surprised, on horseback, to observe in the far distance the tiger moving low to the ground in the tall grass. As the killer approached the prey, the samurai saw him pause. He knew to reason. The spirit of the warrior had overtaken the tiger. Even at this distance, the tiger altered in spirit. His two sword fangs were unsheathed and his eyes passively took in the prey. The true Zanshin, the empty mind of the warrior. Boom. Hmm. Did you write that before painting this or did you write this related to the painting or, or how does it connect to the painting? I mean, obviously, but like for you. Oh, no, no, no. I, I painted this as to sort of connect to my martial art roots and sure. and how that martial art practice really exempt, you know, allowed me to enunciate my painting practice. And I was really attracted to this idea of 
putting all the great warriors and conquerors onto one canvas in conjunction mm. to all the apex predators from the grizzly bear above Wallace, the soaring hawk above the samurai, the killer whale above mm-hmm. uh, under Kimbu Shin, all these different apex predators. To stack this massive warrior archetype <laughs> onto yeah. a canvas, you know, and I do all the different archetypes. This one's the warrior one, and there's an attraction to it culturally today for a reason. And that that poetic uh, writing was done by Jeff Younger. Oh, that's Jeff Younger's writing. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm uh, not as sexy with my words, and um, <laughs> I'm a visual thinker, right? Sure. But but I wanted to I wanted to share that because uh, I think I think a, a poem can describe. The can enunciate that aesthetic feel with the painting really well. You know, it makes sense. I was looking at this while you were reading that, and it makes sense to me why this would be your most popular painting, not just for the the clarity of of the figures in terms of because they're all so distinct and they have their own space and they don't one doesn't flow and point to the other. But the the shape of the gestures is different. You have more feather, teardrop, you know, oval kind of shapes and less sort of square. I don't know, gestural mark, mark making it, this looks more like a, you know, like you've, you've, you've made each shape into an actual thing as opposed to just striking the brush against, like it's more, it's more intentional in that way is how it comes across to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I think people feel, um, like, like movement associated with that. And, and, and and I think, yeah, I think that's the attraction, brother. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. Mm. Well, I, I also noticed that you're really good with eyes. You've got this glowing eye thing going on. Like you, you're really good at like figuring out. Like there was in the in the first one with the Mary and with the with the dragons. There was one little dragon in the lower right hand corner that had these glowing blue eyes. And so now you've got the glowing yellow eyes of the tiger and the glowing red eyes of the guy in the chainmail. Like yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's in, when you paint any kind of face, whether it's an animal or or a human, you know, the, the gaze, brother. You know, often yeah. I, I actually it's funny because. I often make central figures or, or when I want people to, when I want to draw the, the viewer's eye, I do that. I can do that with color theory. You know, if you see a bucket of like, let's say you see a bucket of blue plastic balls. If I put one orange ball in there, where your eye, where's your eye going to go? Right. The orange ball. It's all contrast, right? And that, that, that is a microcosm of what you can do with a hundred different colors. But you can mm-hmm. still guide the eye based on understanding color theory. So, but you can do that. Whilst also playing with the notion of the human gaze. So what I'll do often is with the figure I want people to look at first strikingly, even if it's in the center, I'll, I'll, I, can, I can make a figure that's not on the center be the first one to look at by, mm-hmm. by making all the other eyes flat, but that figure's eye is going to have the pupil there. So you kind of help with kind of look at like, that's the one looking at me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's something that I played with often because um. If I, especially if it's a wider horizontal canvas, I want them to, to not just look at it and I can direct where they, I want them to start from, speaking of which, the hierarchy earlier, and I can direct the viewer's eye. I can curate their emotions based on the composition that they're looking at because um, that's where all the planning comes in, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're doing that intentionally, like it's not an accident. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. All right, let's check out this one, which is a different because it's a one yeah. central finger, but this is also a very popular one. And I had collectors internationally from Paris, Berlin, like Merlon, they all wanted this painting. And for some time, I was like, I have to be able to articulate what's going on with this painting because the offers I had with this painting was, was uh, it, it was a lot. There's a lot of momentum with this. Significant. Yeah, what do you think, brother? I want to hear your um, interpretation. Um, I'll say just on the surface of it, it's, it's not my favorite of the ones you've, sh- you've shown me. Like I like the, the color contrast between the blue and the pink is really good. But like I look at the pink and I just think like sherbet or bubble ga- gum or something like that. Oh. And, I, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't appeal. It doesn't appeal. Like I get that from a, from an art, an international art collector perspective, it kind of plays with this notion of like broken masculinity with this pink and it's sort of subvert. They would see this as subversive. I just look at it and I just, the flavor of that color pink is like, it's affecting my ability to see yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's too sweet tooth, huh? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, the, the, that's not a necessarily like objectively well, I, bad. I mean, this is, a, this, is a, me. this, this is often when people look at, you know, I, 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 here's, let me agree with you, actually. Uh, I often think about what is the ultimate form? Like if there's one word that can kind of, 
summarize and encapsulate everything of effective value, whether it's tech, you're building an app, whether it's a painting, across the board, compression without losing its meaning. And, and often, I see what you're saying, because those other paintings, I'm able to put a complexity of, of, of depth and, and put it onto one installation here. But with this one, it, there's something, even if this painting itself is very complex with the layering and the color alone, but mm -hmm. symbolically, it's obviously just one central figure, boom. Mm -hmm. So there's something to that. And th that says a lot about you, brother. You know, that, that, that you've sort of surfed Finnegan's wake in your mind there. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? A little bit, a little bit. Like, like I guess uh, when you say Finnegan's wake, you're talking about the, the James, is it James Joyce? Is that the one that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, it's, it's a book by James Joyce, which is this idea of like, it's almost like um, you wonder what kind of substances he was writing. But it's this idea of just like letting the mind, I, I guess that's not a good example, but I use that, I was using that as a term for going into deep diving into uncharted territory in your brain, which is what oh, he sure. was kind of trying to get into. And, yes. and this is more like a face value uh, representation of some of the things we've been talking about. I think I can see that. Yeah. I mean, that's, I can, from a perspective, like why would, you know, why would this particular painting be so popular? Why would this draw international attention? Because I can see that if you have a, a feminist perspective, you know, and you don't, you don't recognize that you do. What you see is you see the strong masculine figure cut in half, broken, surrounded by pink, which at least during this phase of human history is considered to be a feminine color. Oh, I guess wow. A, oh, yeah. A fun fact, by the way, I heard, I don't know if this is true, but that it used to be the opposite, that pink used to be the masculine color for little, little boys and blue used to be the feminine color for little girls. And then sometime really? during the 20th century switched. I don't, I can't, conf I, I read that somewhere. I don't know whether it's true or not. But that there was a switch, oh. but so from an international. I, I, I know, I know there, there, there was an inversion of uh, the primary colors with uh, in Christian history, because uh, you just have to look, you can look. I know that, I know that much because I've, yeah. I've studied my color, but I can see that it depends on the period. Yeah. 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 And this, this would be like, you know, the, the, the broken masculine is surrounded, you know, the broken, heavily bounded masculine is surrounded by this free form kind of expressive feminine and it's sort of like it's it's sort of a a, 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 a women dominant kind of well, well, well you are actually touching upon some of the intention behind when i produced this painting oh nice this, th th this idea that masculinity is the most hated thing today so uh -huh. this is kind of exemplifying that because there's my favorite statue in the metropolitan museum of art this is actually like a huge study i did usually when people do studies they just do drawings and then they'll just do like quick paintings. They don't really show so much of them, right? Sure. Uh, but this study basically became like a painting in and of itself because usually I like to stack a lot. You know, I want to challenge myself and I'm into intensity too. Sure. But in this composition, when I go to the Met, my favorite statue is this huge statue of this masculine face that's been sliced in half. And the fact that it's in the front and center. Not because I like what it's implying, but mm -hmm. it says a lot about our culture, I believe. And I think this composition, I don't, by the way, I, never, I mean, I don't know the collector like that. Like I, I, I met the, the gentleman who, who came to get the work, but it's strange enough, we didn't have like a long conversation. So I don't mm -hmm. know what his, his uh, he just knew that this had to be a part of his collection, right? Wow. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. He could have been like, a, he, could have, he could have had that same feeling as me. You could have been a beta. I I don't know, brother. <laughs> well, that was, well, that's a really strange thing. Is that this this? But I'll email him and say that Will Spencer says that you know you're kind of kind of light on loafers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. I, I my YouTube channel lasted for exactly two hours. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I mean, yeah. it's an interesting thought that you can paint something like this and you can pour weeks, months, you know, blood, sweat, and tears into creating a thing that you then sell and then disappears and you may never actually see again. You don't know what it's on the wall next oh, to. Story of my life, man. Dude, I don't know that any people can really appreciate how difficult that is to produce something like that. Like, you don't know what's being done with it. You hope it's being respected. You hope it's being, you know, celebrated for, for what it is. But, you know, maybe it's, it's positioned in such a way to say something that you don't intend. I, I had a, uh, 
you're saying a fear of mine because I actually had an instance early on in my career when I was 20. I, I, I produced this, this, uh, actually I was kind of bamboozled into it because I just wanted to produce work of, you know, ancient statuesque aesthetic at that time, mm-hmm. at that developing stage of my career. And someone asked me to do a commission of this uh, cult-like worshipped homosexual guy, Antinous. And Antinous uh-huh, is like yeah. worshipped in, in, in the gay world and all that. And look, as a commission, it's so fun. Even now, I'd have been like, oh, okay, whatever. Just like pay me, I guess. And you know, I would have gone about it. But turns out what he did is he had me paint it. And he had me paint it with specific colors that, that he had like resentment towards like a certain flag associated with it. Mm-hmm. And, and apparently, I, somebody else told me this that also collected his work, my peer. Say that he hung it upside down. Mm. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, for me, I just took that as like, you know, you never know who's collecting your work. And, yeah. and that could be a complete, that could be his way of saying, um, he got this person of this value to depict somebody he worships due to the, uh, you know, LGBTQ, uh, who knows? Who right. knows? But so many of my collectors, I don't know. But but and that happened when I was twenty, right? Mm-hmm. But but again, like it it didn't hit me too hard because at the end of the day, he, he he paid my rent that month at that stage. Right. But but I I remember when I heard that, I got a really creepy feeling about that. So mm-hmm. if this guy hung this upside down, that says a lot. That's like it almost looked like it, it, at that point, it looks like this man is drowning in pink. Like his head is like. Mm. chopped off it and, and and it's 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 the aesthetics say a lot man you they know do. um and they show uh, who a person is and we we're talking about character how you decide to present your home especially hang up art says a lot about you based on mm-hmm. the art you pick the art you pick is a really good way to get a first impression at that sure yeah and if you don't have art it says a lot about you too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know yeah Anyways, let's not go. Let's go to the next thing so that no, we don't. I like your, I like your, I love your paintings, by the way. I think they're beautiful, but I, they, they wouldn't, they're not my style. They're not something that I would hang in my home for the most part, what I've seen. You know what I mean? Just right. because the color palettes are so bright, they're so vibrant. And I choose to, I, I tend to choose more restrained kind of color palettes, less like large impact kind of visual things and more things that invite investigation and exploration. Like I've got a big photo of this wave. From yeah, this, th- yeah th- this is what I'm talking about. If, if you have too much color, it tends to have a, a, a less intellectual invitation. It, it, it looks... The, f- the first hit is, yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I did that for so long on purpose because I wanted to sort of go into the more mainstream, you know, uh, like this, again, this has a, like, like a very pop sort of feeling in many ways too, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, and I did that intentionally because I was trying to put, plant these seeds of wisdom. But now um, I'm telling you guys, and you're hearing it first on the Renaissance of Man podcast, like when I'm doing this series, when I, when, I'm, when I come back to produce this biblical series, one of the things I've written down is the colors are going to be way watered down. Interesting. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, the colors are going to be way watered down and it's going to become uh, uh, more analogous color schemes rather than complementary. And this mm. is something I'm consciously going to be doing. And it's going to be um, just wait a year, I, I guess, before I start. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, man. It, yeah. Because you couldn't do bright colors with Christian themes because it would come across as, or deep, mis- we'll say mystical Christian themes or timeless or transcendent themes because it would come across as subversive, right? You don't need to see, you know, Jesus in neon colors, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, something of that sort, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, th- this one is titled Kingdom Come. This was acquired by the Special Forces Foundation uh, organization dedicated to supporting Green Beret veterans. Mm. And, uh, you know, those leaves there are cigar leaves. And all of mm. them are uh, 
I met many of these guys at a uh, cigar club I, I regularly attend. And then, as I told you, the majority of my collectors are actually military veterans that are entrepreneurial. This is something that I've noticed. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because they appreciate that there's tribute in my, the language that I'm exploring. And this is a little bit more simple too. It's a little bit more one, two, three, ABC sort of uh, in regards to the intellectual space. Mm-hmm. We had the raising of the flag for the Battle of Iwo Jima. And we have this iconic alpha male lion here with those green dots all over his body. Mm-hmm. But it's sort of, you know, I, I, I didn't know, but everyone can interpret the line in so many different directions. But a lot of biblical scholars, they actually use the line as a representation of benevolent fatherhood. Mm-hmm. And I think that applies to why they're out there fighting, you know? So, so this is, this painting was actually specifically targeted for that audience. And uh, yeah, so, so there, uh, now it's in, I think, I can't say his name. Yeah, but it's, but it's in his collection now, so. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. I love I love the way Thank that you, brother. the the color of the line, like I almost can't take my eyes off it. Like I'm aware that there's the Iwo Jima thing going on in the background, but the color of the line is so vibrant. It's like I almost, you know, I, it's a, it's an effort in a good way to look around and be like, oh, look at all those those little um those little shapes that you have kind of sprinkled around in the grass. Like Yeah, I like, I mean look look at those dots. Yeah, man. Oh man. Okay, you see this is the extreme close up. Oh, look at the eyes. That's awesome. I'm sorry for all you people yeah, listening yeah. on the podcast. You should go to YouTube right now. Well, we should have done this the whole time. We can get the like the actual little nitty gritties here. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. For sure. I, I didn't even know I could do that. Actually, I just I just said, oh wait, hold on a second. The mouse yeah. has like this little X on it. Maybe I can. Oh, I can see. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Beautiful, brother. Well, hey, listen, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can um, continue here now <laughs> yeah well that was awesome thank you for that a uh, little journey through some of the highlights of your art and I, of course i see your favorite sitting behind you yeah and and, and you know guys I, I, i'm telling you that what you guys just saw are some of the work that garnered me so much attention and i had some of those magazines running around me all, all that hype that's behind some of my name in new york city mm-hmm. but here's the thing like what i'm going to be working on now I've been planning this for quite some time. I have notebooks that I've been just writing notes just by listening to podcasts with pastors or talking to my father, who's a minister, um, who also knows his whole roster of other Christian ministers and academics too. And getting some apologetics, like just, just diving into the content, a lot of planning going on colors are going to actually be less. It's funny you say that because this is something I'm realizing. I have to make the color less for what I'm going to about to do in the, at this next stage and be ready. This is going to be my magnum opus. And you rich people listening, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm serving patrons. And I have a lot of, I mean, all my collectors are rich actually, obviously, because you know sure. it's, it's art, it's luxury. <laughs> But I want someone who has that like fuck you money to mm-hmm. throw down a gauntlet and say, this is we're going to we're going to put an uppercut in the culture, like mm-hmm. a serious uppercut in the culture. And this is gonna be like a like five year project just to make the paintings. Cause I want to make a painting for every book of the Bible. Mm-hmm. A big a one. A wow. big one. You know? Wow. I'm in the Bible. Nice. So it's like 39, you know. Matthew, Mark, Luke, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, to all those people listening, you know, I, I, I think it's really hard to avoid the conclusion that we're in, we're in a cultural war, and um, the war take the war has been going on for quite a long time. That's why the talk, my talk at twenty one was waking up on the battlefield. There are a lot of people that are just now, a lot of men, especially and women as well, that are waking up and realizing that we're at war (laughs) culturally, and, um the battle is going to come to you. And so you have to make a choice to stand up for what you believe in and to show up on the battlefield. And that is a, a, a full spectrum thing in your life. 
you know, and we're seeing it now. We're seeing it. It's in your workplace. It's in your family. It's with your friends. It's in your social media. It's potentially in your bank accounts. It's, you know, in the, in the price of groceries at the, at the supermarket. Like it's, it's every, every place is a battlefield and it sucks. It sucks, but it is what it is. And so you have to show up and be counted with your choice of where you give your money to. And are you going to start giving it to artists who are actually pushing back at the root? A lot of these ideological roots, the, the, the creative expression, the artistic expression of artists communicates on a subconscious, even spiritual level, like a subconscious and a super conscious level. You know, only artists can fight on those battlefields. Only artists can fight at the highest level of transcendence and the deeper level of emotional and I guess the, deep, the deepest level of, of emotion. And so that's what artists are for. And so we got to show up and fight the battle in that way too. And so, yeah. you know, but that takes money. It's not, it, it's yeah. not cheap to produce great art, right? The starving artist is not a thing. Yeah, we got it. We got it. I, I mean, look, if we're going to take the culture back, we need the artists and we need the fat walls behind them. <laughs> yeah. 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 And like yeah. The, 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 the goal may not even be to take, who knows if we can take the culture back. But what we can say is we're going to show up on the battlefield and at least we're going to push. At least we're going to say, no, we're not going to go quietly and simply accept you know, what you tell us we have to think through art and culture. We're going to assert, we're going to produce our own culture and you're going to have to contest with us in the open, in the sunlight, and we'll see whose culture is superior. At least we get to do that. If we get to that point, brother, I mean, uh, if, we, if we can put that on the world stage, you know, it's, it's what uh, Socrates was talking about. Yeah. You know, 3%. If we get 3%, then at, with our quality, it'll speak for itself. That's right. We yeah. are going to put that on the world stage. Here, here, brother. Here, here. Um, all right, man. Hey, listen, man. It, it, it's such a pleasure. And Will, you are a beautiful man. If I was a woman, you'd be a 10 and you are crushing the game, man. And uh, God bless <laughs> you, man. Thank you so much, <laughs> Arthur. You, you flatter me. I appreciate it. And I, I, think you're, I think you're a fantastic man. And I think you're way, way better than a four. Way better than a four. Self-evaluation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. A 10 as well. But before we go... Where can men go to find out more about you and what you do? Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you want to follow my work, um, just Arthur Kwan Lee on all platforms, on Instagram, Twitter. I'm pretty late to the Twitter game and I'm, uh, I'm doing what I can. Uh, and you can <laughs> Google Arthur Kwan Lee, go to ArthurKwanLee.com. If you want to join the creative collective, and there's really nothing like this in regards to an art collective, most art collective, as every artist here who has been in an art collective knows, it's just a bunch of liberals getting together talking bad about conservatives while drinking their wine. It, it, that, that's what they are. But Sounds this right. this is the art collective. We have Dr. Kevin Liu coming to do a speech with us. He's the most known student of Dr. Jordan Peterson. Uh, we have writer circles. We have, we are doing a book club with Excavator, the guy who's in Canada crushing it with his writing against postmodern thinkers. We have we have all these uh, different resources, and not only that, we're working on a lot of stuff to put ourselves out there and we are going to start a movement in originism. So if you want to join the conversation or if you just want to develop an artistic voice and find a medium, the Genesis council, genesiscouncil.com. And, um, I will say, well, we reject way more people. I've rejected nice. a lot of people. Yeah. Because, because Good. we, because we want it to be like the green berets, right? Quality over quantity. We That's only right. want people, not about talent, but we want the right values, mm -hmm. right? We want people who understand what America is, understand how to yield our artistry towards something more logic, and we understand that um, we have to find our tribe, and this is a place for the artists. Amen. And I think I think communities have the right to determine who comes in and who doesn't, and we need to get past this notion of everyone needs to be admitted to everything because that isn't the case. My brother, right on. Well, thank you so much, Arthur. This has been wonderful and. And uh, man, keep doing what you're doing and best of luck as you head out on this new adventure to produce your magnum opus. God bless you, man. Uh, much love.